Hello students, good afternoon everyone. So, we will be starting with uh, <coughs> ancient history, we will be discussing ancient history, little fast we will try to do that. So, important features of history, the important aspects of the study of history are to know why we should read history first point, to know how did agriculture other means of existence begin, how this agriculture if you take economy, agriculture industry or service sector, how this has begun, what is the origin of this, right, how a person who is sitting in a stone cave he is coming back to the plains and doing agriculture that is where we will read it. And when did our primitives begin to use metal and how did they develop spinning, weaving, metal working, all these are the technologies. How did they started developing all these technologies to trace the origin of that and how did the political and administrative systems evolve, how is the political system, how they managed these resources, how was the administrative system, how is the culture, how is the society, what is the status of women, what is the status of different sections of people in the society who are vulnerable sections all this can be learned from history. You need to remember reading history is very important to decide our future. So, we could not we do not have the luxury to repeat the mistakes if we have to progress right. So, how did the development of literature, urban life, science, architecture evolve etcetera. So, these are going to be the focus for understanding the history why we need to read history. <coughs> so, normally people perceive that it is only the reading of dates right it is just the description of dates and events related to the kings or dynasties but rather in uh, present UPSC state civil services most of the focus is on various aspects of society, various aspects of society, various aspects of people like culture, like art, like architecture, like technology, like science as I said. So, these are the major focuses right kings are not the focuses who are the focus people are focused right how did the, how did this society evolved consider religion how was the religion then how is religion now religious tolerance principles likewise multidisciplinary requirement is there for this understanding right therefore the study of history is to is the study of entire human past which goes back to millions of years but we don't have the record of everything that is what you need to remember history is study of human past but uh, how do you remember everything you just have to read through the books when you read through the books or when you read through anything it is basically through bias so, we are not sure how far we have uh, the uh, data available, how far the numbers are available without bias, right. Throughout the period from ancient, medieval, modern based on the chronological uh, sequence, we have divided uh, history into ancient, medieval and modern. Every society has developed over a long period of time. However, they differ in terms of courses, they followed and process they underwent. So, for example, if you talk about administration, we will talk about modern administration, then Mughal administration, then British administration, then Indian administration. To understand the evolution of Indian administration, you need to see, look back to that particular thing. Likewise, this is very important. What are the different processes and what are the set of uh, patterns they have followed that we need to remember, that we need to understand. So, do not focus on the kings, not the life of the kings, not the luxury of the kings, but the people we need to focus on because we are reading for civil services. The primitives experienced a stone age, hunter gatherers and they all practice agriculture. Later first you saw stone age people, then you saw hunters and gatherers, then people started agriculture. They started practicing agriculture. Over a period of time primitives began to use metal to for example, to cultivate they started using metals. So, what was the initial metal they have used? Bronze, then iron. Likewise, the evolution even now if we speak about ages, we are talking about iron age, we are in iron age. <coughs> that evolution we will try to understand. Next, 
the study of history helps as i said cultural social political religious identity this is where our focus is on our major focus should be on these things right how the administration was how the political administration was how the resources were managed how the culture is how the religion is these are the things we need to remember the study of history helps in understanding the people societies and nations and finally the whole humanity get a sense of identity and belonging so normally if vivekananda is coming back and saying that go back to vedas he is trying to tell you that find your identity you are not weaker you are not weaker when you compare to british empire right you have your own identity go back to vedas sanskrit is there that is what he is trying to establish so when you look back you have an identity history will give you confidence history will give you clarity history will make sure that you will not repeat the same mistakes those are called historical mistakes when people don't read history it will come at a cost right the study of history helps in understanding people societies nations this way we need to understand it may be superficial we have to ask if someone ask you a question why should i read history does it contribute to anything economically to our society does it solve any problems of poverty and unemployment of course history has answer to all these questions when you don't understand the cultures when you don't understand the religions when you don't understand the societies when you don't understand poverty in depth so what is the solution there is no solution without understanding the society so understanding the society better understanding of the society will come up with unemployment issues or poverty issues either it is economical social political any issue the solution is understanding right when you identify a problem then understand the problem then you can prescribe a solution right history further makes us learn lessons from the past and present paths for the present and future it reminds us not to repeat the same mistakes if you are if you are doing any historical mistakes then it is going to be the same society again then there is no evolution then we are going back into the history if you are doing the same mistake again and again if you are doing the same mistake again and again you will keep failing the same way you need to understand here if you don't read the history whether it is political dimension or social dimension or economical dimension it is not going to give a clarity for you the solutions will not be prompt history guides us why and how to ignore bad things created problems in society and follow things which create promote harmony peace and prosperity that is the reason why when you look back to the history when you look up uh, look back to ashoka when you look back to chandragupta maurya when you when you look back to all these guptas you try to understand how the society dwelled peacefully who are those kings what they did what is their culture what is the model what is the framework of the society that is our focus so to promote harmony peace and prosperity when there is harmony when there is peace and prosperity half of the problems are gone when you say poverty it is easy to eradicate poverty in peace than without order so remember so to create societies so whenever you talk about society for example in hindu parlance you call it as ram rajya ram rajya why because the society used to be peaceful and harmonious then the same perspective okay example as i said ashoka will come into picture whenever you talk about religious tolerance and all the things but romila da possessed a different perspective about ashoka let us keep that aside for a while ashoka the king of ancient pataliputra in his rock edict 12 rock edict 12 instead of the following measures and practices to maintain harmony peace and prosperity in the society he insisted sorry insisted few practices to promote harmony peace and prosperity whenever you talk about panchasil whenever you talk about internal security these are the three parameters which are important for you right so how to do that common ground or root of all religion promotion of common ground first thing second one cultivation of sense of unity unity and diversity now right unity fraternity right sisterhood brotherhood the practice of vachaguti are restrained from criticism of other religions and sex what do you need to have religious tolerance is it is it the isn't it the basic principle of the society even now so this is the fundamental principle of this society religious tolerance many religions came into this country so apart from even though there is a big debate whether hindu is a religion or not let us keep that aside there are islam mahmadians there are christians there are syrians uh, syrian christians there are uh, parsis there are jews there are buddhas buddhist right buddhist and uh, jina there are n number of religions uh, which are being practiced in india and uh, what led them to take up any faith of their own after 1950 it is constitution which is giving them fundamental right but before 1950 also remember that is religious tolerance which is derived from such kings such practices the coming together 
samavaya of exponents is different religions in religious assemblies debate discussions dialectics when you discuss debate then we will realize that it is all for the common ground it is all for the human kind goodness human kind peace human kind harmony learning the text of other religions so as to become bahu shruta or proficient in scriptures of different religions so religion used to play a major role in those times but uh, nowadays now the countries are leading secular life because of which our religion have less dominance so but still likewise this is going to be important what is there in rock edict 12 is quite important it is important for history it is important for polity it is important for administration it is important for ethics likewise so history is very important so as i said <clears throat> the purpose of reading history is the purpose of reading history is the past does not mean that one lives in the past but one learns to live with the past so understanding of history is to learn the past and learn to live with the past history gives a society or a nation an identity right if you say that uh, my vedic civilization we have indus valley civilization dating back to 2500 bc that is what identity you are deriving it right identity is giving you Walter if you take Walter a great intellectual and statesman from France contended that India is the cradle of worldly civilization this is the essay question also sometime back in UBSC cradle of worldly civilization and homeland of religion and in its oldest and purest form so Walter is clearly saying that India is a cradle of worldly civilization and it's a homeland for religion in its oldest and purest form so those primitive religions uh, persisted here so we are trying to understand who said what about history especially about indian history walter father wrote in short i am convinced that everything astronomy astrology metaphysics comes to us from the bank of ganges they believe that although we are trying to uh, derive our identity from this so we are taking to take uh, we are trying to take uh, those optimistic points of view from walter who says that everything is emerging from ganges the literature is emerging from ganges so if you say uh, pierre d so right a french naturalist and traveler believed that all knowledge came from india which is cradle of civilization he too he is in agreement with what he said walter immanuel kant so who is very important for uh, categorical imperative in ethics is a great philosopher of germany recognized the greatness of ancient indian culture and civilization he acknowledged that indian religious thoughts were free of rigidity and intolerance so one of the important feature of religion is that it should not be rigid it should not be it should not be intolerant so all those principles which are being taught here all these are the moral principles these are basis for many code of conducts in most of the most parts of the world so this is what they are trying to say right about indian history especially so we saw walter we saw immanuel kant so this is the person categorical imperative very important person right Immanuel Kant wrote about India the religion has a great purity one can find traces of pure concept of divinity and cannot easily be found elsewhere else right so somehow Walter somehow this particular Immanuel Kant are in agreement that India is the cradle of civilizations India is a cradle of civilizations India is so tolerant so it is in basic uh, feature of uh, India that it is tolerant because of which many religions came here when the when people were persecuted let it be parsis let it be muslim let it be jews whenever in any part of the world these people are being persecuted they came to india settled in india became india so you need to understand this is the ocean of religions with many rivers flew into this so writing of ancient history if you talk about the next topic writing of ancient history who will talk about where do i derive from what are the different resources through which i can see the history what are those lenses which are available for me let's go through that first one during 4th century bc bc when uh, we are talking about rise of magadha kautilya in his book arthashastra advises the king to dedicate some time for hearing of narrations of the history one must understand the history if you don't understand the history historical mistakes will be repeated history was conferred holiness equal to pious veda atharvana veda brahmanas and upanishads so he is clearly stressing that kautilya is also stressing that history is as important as the other itihasas and puranas which are branches of knowledge veda itself the name veda itself he is saying that knowledge so puranas 
if you know about puranas what are puranas puranas mostly which are which are not been accepted as a historical text but accepted as mythology there are 18 puranas 18 subsidiary puranas the subject matter of the history are as per the puranas sarga evolution of universe the first focus is on evolution of universe you see in geomorphology geography prati sarga involution of the universe right evolution involution the opposite one and manavatar right manavantantar recurring of time okay similarly vamsa genealogical list of the kings and sages whenever you talk about for example if you talk about rama you say ikshvaku kula tilaka ikshvaku right you are trying to trace back to the origin of that particular person we are trying to keep those identities we don't want to discard those identities with identity we are becoming confident so let us keep the identity so vamsan charitra life stories of some selected characters so this is available in history which is puranas the reign of Parikshit, the grandson of Arjuna, when you talk about Arjuna, you know about Arjuna Pandavas, the grandson of Arjuna is Parikshit, Parikshit Maharaj, was considered as the benchmark for the reference of royal genealogies given in Puranas. So whenever you talk about uh, before Parikshit, after Parikshit, like uh, we, we, we talk about uh, before Christ and after Christ, right, the same way, before Parikshit and after Parikshit is a reference point for Puranas. In Puranas, all earlier dynasties and kings prior to the reign of Parikshit have been mentioned in past tense and uh, later kings were narrated in future tense okay so that is the reason why we say parikshit is the reference point this may be due to the fact that puranas were completed during the reign of parikshit as mentioned in the puranas the coronation of parikshit marks the beginning of the kali age so according to the hindu belief system that kali age started from the reign of this particular parikshit who is the grandson of this particular arjuna who is pandavas pandavas kauravas mahabharat all this you know So, in the context of Puranas, it is observed that ancient India, Itihas, see Itihas in English is uh, history, but uh, somehow we only accept it as a mythology. We do not uh, keep it as a standard reference point, although we see many archaeological sources, but we do not uh, accept it as a source of for history. Look it upon and means to illuminate the present and future of the light in the past, right? If you want to illuminate a light on the past and try to learn the future that is where we have to go that is his itihas that is history the purpose of history was to understand and inculcate the sense of duty sacrifice an individual to their families by the families to the clans by the clans to their villages the villages to janapada and rashtra the same way we are talking about now village to mandal mandal to district district to the state day state to the nation one must have duty to self duty to family family duty to the kula here we are talking about kula but brotherhood then we talk about national duty this is called integrity right the ultimate sense of sacrifice when you talk about sacrifice this is the ultimate uh, value which is given by buddha buddhism during history during ancient time history was treated as a powerful vehicle of awakening of cultural and social consciousness therefore the narrations of puranas were compulsory part of annual ritual in any village if you go to any village particularly now also you can see most of the time they play Bahabharat, they play uh, um, ramayan they play different uh, khandas of ramayan right all this is because this is not only in the text this is part of way of life right so these are the cultural identities which we are still carrying which are triggered by such events dramas right so to bring the history to understanding of common man such systems are there even now village histories are there right when you go to temple temple histories are there they are kept still now for any reason at the time of the festivals fe pargitar and hc rai choudhury have attempted to write history on the base of genealogies of various dynasties mentioned in puranas they have tried but still uh, you know it is like white man's acceptance is not there we don't accept as history but we are uh, changing that perspective without white man's without white man's acceptance also we can go forward now raj tarangini by kalhana kalhana raj tarangini another work of history which enjoys the great respect among historians to approach its historical content especially ancient one kalhana's raj tarangini so apart from that if you see into the sources as i said puranas i spoke about arthashastra as i spoke about raj tarangini right there are many texts we only can reveal we can only remember few right so apart from that if you see the early uh, foreigners who traveled to india especially herodotus 
Nearchus, Megasthenes, Plutarch, Arian, Strabo, Pliny, Elder, and Ptolemy. All these are the different foreigners who came to India. Their contributions and their texts, especially when you come back to Megasthenes, during during 324 and 300 BC, when I talk about this, we have talked about Chandragupta Maurya in time, the rise of Magadha Empire, Megasthenes, the Greek ambassador visited the court of Chandragupta Maurya, right? So, Megasthenes in his famous book, Indica, gave detailed account about society, polity and this contemporary India, but unfortunately, this is no longer available to us. This book is not available to us, but still, uh, there are mentions about polity, right? He visited all the kingdoms available in India, even the smaller kingdoms and uh, noted them right so they it is available in this particular book but indirectly the references of indica are available but indica is not available megasthenes affirms about the existence of an array of 153 kings so array when you talk about this array right 153 kings so republics might be whose reigns had covered the time period of about 6053 years up till then so the writings of megasthenes further had a source of information about the ancient time uh, uh, for most of the Greek times, including Diodorus, Strabo, Arian. So even these people gave reference about Megasthenes Indica. As I said, Megasthenes Indica is not available, but Megasthenes Indica references are available. References are available. <coughs> Next one, Al Biruni, one of the important personality. So these are the people who are reconstructing the history of India, ancient history, remember. Alberni, born in 913 AD, the central part of the Asia, central part of Asia, central Asia. He was a contemporary of Muhammad Ghazi, Muhammad of Ghazi. His name is Muhammad and Ghazi is the right place. And accompanied by Muhammad when conquered central Asia, likewise he came in contact with the Indian culture. He is also one of the important person. Uh, why he is very important? Let us understand this. Like C.B. Brown for Telugu, Alberni learned Sanskrit language. He learned Sanskrit language to gain precise knowledge on Indian society. He made multidimensional observations ranging from philosophy, religion, culture, science, literature, art, medicine. So he understood the language, he understood the society, he understood the culture. So the better understanding, other than the observational understanding, he got into the system. He got into the society and learned. So, because of which Alberni is very important. The book Alberni, the work of Alberni is free from all religious or racial bias. There is no bias, right? All the historians say that Alberni books are clear historical context. He died in Ghazni, Afghanistan. Apart from that, Christian missionaries enlightenment. The contribution of Christian missionaries during 17th and 18th century was uh, mainly affected by the religious and political movements in Europe. So a large number of works were produced in India by the Christian missionaries, but their writings can hardly be said to be fair because there will be religious or racial bias. So that superior racial feeling is there and because of that jealousness, maybe most of the times historians don't find them as uh, non-partisan. So as I said, many works are there, but none of them stands, uh, not, none of them stands proximate to al -Biruni. Some other groups of European scholars, including John Howell, Nantel, Hallhead, Alexander Dow, written about Indian history and culture, proving the preeminence of Indian civilization in the ancient world. But still, as I said, Alberini, Megasthenes, Indica, Raj Tarangini, Puranas. So these are the places where we look back and try to trace back the history. Especially when we talk about Mauryans, Satvahanas in ancient history, we go back to Puranas and try to sort out those historical timeless chronology. Hallwell, had written that Hindu texts contain a higher revelation than Christian one. Somehow biased. That bias towards Hinduism. Hal had, had discussed the vast periods of time of human history assigned for four yugas and concluded that human reason can be more reconciled to itself. The idea of patriarchal longevity for a few thousand years, the entire span of the human race. Right. So he is more stressing on uh, Hindu religious texts. Apart from that, the imperial, right? So we need to understand those people who are merchants, those people who became colonialists, those people who became imperialists, they also have something to say about ancient Indian history. Asiatic Society of Bengal established in 1784, one of the important MCQ here, Asiatic Society contributed towards writing of Indian history. Imperialistic writings were mostly reflecting the contemporary debate about religious faith 
and nationality and their interest in enlarging European colonies and economic exploitation. So their intention is to enlarge their area. Their, their attention is towards enlarging the colony, right? Increasing the size of those colonies and economically benefit from them, exploit. So intellectuals, those people who are intellectuals, most of the students you might have heard about them in polity or sociology or political science somewhere. Max Muller, leading imperialist intellectual, which you need to remember of 19th century, Max Muller, John Stuart Mill, William Jones, Karl Marx, and W. Hegel, Hegelian. So comes, let's start with Max Muller, Frederick Max Muller. He is considered as one of the most respected Indologists, right? He is talking about Indology. So when you talk about anthropology, when you talk about sociology, Indology is one of the important terms. Of the 19th century, he was a German, but lived in England on the financial support of British East India Company, he undertook massive jobs of translation and interpretation of religious texts of in English. He attained the best achievement getting translated huge mass, as I said, huge mass Sanskrit texts. You remember Albiruni? You have to remember Max Muller. Max Muller, Albiruni, these are the people who learned Sanskrit and learned about our books, then translated them. So most of the students find it difficult to read Sanskrit now. Most of the students find it difficult to write Sanskrit exams, but still. Into English, but its approach and intention were never free from prejudice. Apart from uh, Alberini, when you compare uh, Max Muller with uh, Alberini, he is prejudiced. Intentions are different. The objective or goal is different. Muller was inspired his religious belief and political requirements that affected entire approach of unbiased writing and interpretation of Indian history. The guiding principle under which William Jones, uh, Max Muller and Vincent Smith wrote Indian history was to settle all history within the period of 4000 BC. So they tried to settle that Indian history is very small, Indian identity is very less and we are going to give you identity. So that is their intention to downsize the timelines and tell whatever uh, the timelines which were existing before as mythology. In 1868, Max Muller wrote to Duke of uh, Argyll, the ancient religion of India is doomed and if Christianity does not step in, whose fault it will be or whose fault will it be? Who is writing that? Max Muller is writing that. You can see that he is having a strong religious prejudice. So, so Again, nowhere in comparison with Alberini, keep Alberini in mind, who came with Mahmud of Ghazni. The majority of works done in Indian history during 18th and 19th century were guided by preconditions imposed by the belief of Genesis or reject all the writing that were projecting India's past in terms of great civilization and Indian philosophy and thoughts inculcating great antiquity and the origin of universe and human beings. So they always rejected the greatest antiquity which is available to us, that is our heritage, our history, right? They are rejecting it. The very, the very basic uh, precondition to this is to reduce the size of history to 4000 years and to reject all theories which are talking about great civilization, right? So if you speak, it is not great civilization. It is to conclude that India is not great civilization. The major factor that is responsible for distortion of ancient Hindi history was British imperial interest, as I said. British imperial interest, British religious interests were dominating all those things. So because of which uh, they tried to develop inferiority complex in the minds of Indian people so that they will become literally weak and uh, lose their confidence. They start believing that these people, they started believing that Christianity and the British imperial interests would settle the future of India. But unfortunately they had to go back when our uh, freedom fighters took non-violent struggle. James Mill, father of John Stuart Mill, 1806 to 1818, uh, James Mill wrote six volumes of history about India without ever visiting to India. He never came to India. He never learnt about any Indian language, but he divided Indian history into three periods, Hindu period, Muslim period, and British period. No one accepts it. No historian accepts it. This is one of the foolish categorization which is available about Indian history without any logic and justification. Mill presented that extremely demeaning picture of Hindu periods. He condemned every institution. He spoke about women. He spoke about caste. He spoke about politics. He spoke about every other institution. Right? Whatever the knowledge uh, we had in our history way back, 
was demeaned right looked down action of hindu period and held hindus responsible for all the ills of the country hindu are the responsible for historical mistakes so the agenda when the agenda is clear and the research objective is clear so they have the prejudice already right mills book was introduced as a textbook uh, in the harley berry school of england which was established to educate the young englishman coming to india and administrator of civil service right this book taught about indian history in british education system those students who came back to india thinking that they were dominant so ideologically polluted as i said james mill his son john stuart mill and his disciple thomas macaulay thomas macaulay macaulay minutes first law commission right civil services commission thomas macaulay you remember this is the person who is the reason for those children who couldn't read english even now played a very important role in shaping imperialist policy in india and the future of indian education in the core and distorted history of india nep is saying that all this education should be in religional languages these are the people who sat in 1850s changed the future of these children of india 1840s james mill john stuart mill thomas macaulay these are the thomas babington macaulay these are the people who told that education should be in english people should be indian they should have habits of uh, english they should be able to read english they should be servants of english so the industry is british east india company to supply employees to british east india company the education system was completely employee oriented there is no innovation creativity no one were told to take employer role they were all told to become employees they were all told to become servants that colonial hangover is still there in schooling colleges everywhere v s smith an officer serving the british government in india prepared the textbook called early history of india in 1904 he emphasized the role of foreigners in ancient india alexander's invasion accounted for almost one third of the book right he said about alexander alexander and if you take v s smith book racial superiority superiority is clear he is racially biased and the triumphant progress of alexander from himalayas to the sea demonstrated inherent weakness of the greatest asiatic armies which confronted with the uh, european skill and discipline is what he told in his book one third of the book he spoke about in indian history one third of the, this book he spoke about alexander who didn't even arrive till ganges he didn't came to india completely he went back right after fighting with porus so smith had given an impression that alexander had conquered the whole india from himalayas to the seas uh, which in fact he only touched the north west borders of india as i said uh, he fought with uh, porus v s smith so whatever you are trying to understand you try to understand that these textbooks which were given were of racial superiority and religious superiority they were here to give a servant education smith had presented india as a land of dictatorship which did not experience political unity until the establishment of british rule but remember mauryan empire pandyan empire gupta empire these are very vast empires to be frank no european empire is bigger no european empire can even be compared to mauryan empire right so even you take any satavahana empire these ancient empires used to be very broad geographically vast and they say political dictatorship and many republics were there when you talk about mahajanpad these are republics right the whole approach of imperial historians was to give an interpretation of indian history to degenerate indian character and achievements and to justify colonial rule you are to be you are to be mastered you are the servants we are the masters you need to be mastered you don't have any history you are primitives so we need to give civilization to you you are uncivilized people this is what being taught in those books tell until later people realized right so if you take vincent arthur vincent arthur smith in 1843 to 1920 prepared the first systematic history of ancient india that published in india on the basis of bible story of creation of bishop asha had calculated the whole universe was created at 9 am on 23 october 4004 bc and the great flood took place in 2349 bc so 
when any particular historian from Europe takes references from Bible, this is still history. But if any particular person in India takes reference from Purana, that is mythology. You cannot talk about it. In the light of Indian concept, the age of earth is several hundred million years that Bible stories of creation appears to be wrong and threaten the very foundation of the faith. So changing the timeline, as I said, uh, they have to, they, their intention is to summarize the history. As I said, the religious bias, racial bias was there in the minds of the imperial historians to establish their colonial rule. The, the agenda is to justify colonial rule. With the object to promote Sanskrit learning among the English, Bowdoin Professorship of Sanskrit at Oxford University was endowed by Colonel Bowdoin. This was precisely for enabling his countrymen to proceed in the conversion of natives of India and the Christian religion. As I said, religious bias. Again, when they are reading Sanskrit, when not everyone, when we are talking about few people who are giving more impact on the systems of India, we are only talking about that. There are many people who are very good people who read Sanskrit, who understood societies, did good for the society. But we are talking about those people who couldn't do anything, those imperialists. Prizes were offered to literary works for refutation of the Hindu religious systems and undermining Indian tradition. If any particular Hindu religious text was divided, then the prizes were given to them. So they were encouraged to, to prove the Hindu texts were wrong. So that is how the imperial texts were there. So remember these people, V. S. Smith, James Mill, John Stuart Mill, Max Miller, Max Miller. Right, these are the people, important people. When you talk about imperial people, imperialists who wanted to justify, imperialists who wanted to justify what is uh, uh, colonial rule, when they wanted to justify colonial rule, they always wanted to downsize the history of India and uh, uh, named Hindus as a reason for everything. Max Miller, John Stuart Mill, J. S. Mill, and his son John Stuart Mill, James Mill, John Stuart Mill, William Jones, Karl Marx, Hegel. These are the few people. But remember, the agenda is to clearly, uh, the agenda is to clearly downsize the history of India. They had a racial and they have clearly religious bias. As the intention is not to discuss about everything, sir, the intention is to tell you that imperial, imperial historians are biased. So, the same way Muhammad of Ghazni came, but when uh, all Bernese texts are taken as a reference, historians accepted his non-partisan attitude and they accepted it as a source of our history and timeline, but uh, still we have problems with this. If you talk about national intellectuals, some of the national intellectuals who understood Indian history are Rajendra Lal Mitra, R.G. Bandarkar, R.C. Majumdar and Rajwade. Bandarkar and Rajwade worked in the history of Maharashtra region and reconstructed social, political, economic history of that particular area specifically. So others try to prove the Indian point of view. The other people, Bandarkar, Rai Chaudhary, Mazumdar, Kane, Altekar, Jaiswal, Nilkant Sastri, Mahalingam, Sire, R.K. Mukherjee were some of the other Indian historians who attempted to describe Indian history according to Indian point of view. So dear Bandarkar in his books on Ashoka and ancient polity helped in clearing many myths created by imperial historians. So, now all the biases, all the myths which were created by the imperialists had to be countered by Indian historians. So giving history without bias is very difficult. So now I hope you started understanding the importance of the history. Jaiswal revealed on the basis of his study literary and uh, epigraphical sources that India was not a despotic country as propagated by imperialist historians, but rather India is a tradition of republics as I said. From the Rigvedic times there were republics, even in during the Mahajanpad, when you talk about Buddhism, Jainism also there were republics. The concept of republic is not uh, alien to India. No European taught what is republic. No European taught how to manage our resources without centralization. With the decentralization, we have administered our resources even before. Jaiswal Hindu Party is considered as one of the most important books ever written on ancient history. If you take Rai Chaudhary, reconstructed the history of ancient India from times of Mahabharata war to the times of Gupta Empire to practically clear the clouds which were created by the V. S. Smith. We spoke about Vincent Smith when he cleared many clouds and myths around this particular history. The title of his book is Political History of Ancient India. So he tried to give that Indian point of view, rejecting those imperial perspectives. And uh, Majumdar, Majumdar wrote many books on history from ancient India to the freedom struggle. Majumdar is considered as a leader among Indian historians. 
is the most outstanding achievement under the internship publication of history and culture of Indian people in 11 volumes. K. Nilakanta Sastri, in his books, A History of Ancient History of South India, especially when we speak about Satavahanas, when we speak about Chola, Chalukya Pandyas, so this person is coming into picture. Contributed immensely towards understanding of South Indian history. Nilakanta Sastri. And if you talk about Mukherjee, in his books including Hindu civilization, Chandragupta Maurya, Asoka, fundamental unity of India expressed that culture, economic, political history of India in simple terms made accessible to everyone reader. So Mukherjee is one of the person who made Ahmadmi to understand about history. Similarly, Kane, a great Sanskritist, worked in history of Dharma Sastra in five volumes considered by encyclopedia of social, religious, uh, political and customs. Best approach? Best approach is the best approach for history, political, economical, social, technological. So then Marxist view of history. So Marx and Karl Marx and Hegel. So they spoke about historical materialism. When they spoke about historical materialism, they're talking about primitive communism, slavery, feudalism, capitalism, communism. So this is what their perception about history. The stage of history proposed by Marx and Engels were based on their understanding about European history. So when they speak, when they spoke about capitalism, there is no industrialism even in India. We were facing feudalism. Still then, Jamindars used to be there. They clearly acknowledged the intellectual debt of Hegel and Lewis Heldry Morgan. So if you take Karl Marx, Hegel, he is also one of the Western philosophers. Karl Marx wrote a book called Das Capital. Right? When you talk about communism, socialism, he is one of the important thinker there. He made no attempt to learn Sanskrit or any Indian language. His writings on Indian history and philosophy were based mainly on the writings of William Jones, James Mill and other British writers. As I said, when Hegel is writing in something about Indian history, he is dependent on those texts which are available in Britain, who, which were written by imperialists like James Mill, John Stuart Mill, Max Muller, V. A. Smith, like people. Hegel reluctantly accepted that India had a philosophical system. He accepted India had a philosophical system, Sankhya, Nyaya, Yoga, right, Mimamsa, like philosophical system, history and great antiquity and he explicitly considered Indian system to be inferior to Greeks and Romans. So the agenda is to establish superiority and inferiority. Greeks, Romans, Indians, all are contemporaries, but still they were told to. So Marx acknowledge knowledge about India was not really free from racial consideration. He took lead from Eagle. Marx was the greatest supporter of British rule in India and dismissed India as a backward, dismissed India as a backward and uncivilized nation without history because his perception is based on those imperialist historians. Hegelian and Marxian approach to Indian history by and large remained dormant for a long time. It was largely non-existing during British rule in India. Right. Marxist school of historiography became one of the most influential and dominant schools after independence of India. Their perceptions became, their perceptions used to be dormant, later became important. Marx held that all that is good in Indian civilization is the contribution of the conquerors. So all that is good in Indian civilization is contribution of the conquerors. Right? Therefore, according to this school, the Kushana period is the golden period of Indian history and not Satvahanas or Guptas. So that is the reason why the glorification of Kushanas are there in the early independent texts also. The brief time of Kushanas is good, then what about Satavahanas? What about Guptas? Why can't it be golden period? Because his focus is mostly on conquerors. According to Marxist school of history, the period of Guptas to conquest Muslims in 12th century AD has been termed as the period of feudalism that is dark age during which everything is degenerated, unlike uh, there used to be a glorious period during Gupta's time also. D.D. Kosambi was the first among the pioneers of Marxist school of thought. Chanana, R.S. Sharma, Romila Tarpan, Irfan Habib, Bipin Chandra and Satish Chandra are some of the leading Marxist historians of India. Marxist thought, Marxist influence, Marxist school. In the Marxist scheme of history, the Soviet Union was the ideal state and Marxism is the ideal philosophy. Even now, most of the people read, as I said, R.S. Sharma, they read uh, Satish Chandra, Bipin Chandra, and uh, extremely Romila Tapa. So when you read that, uh, they are quite influenced and biased about Marxism. 
and uh, that perspective will be revealed, but still these are the standard books. So hence we understood uh, where we are trying to construct history from. We did not suddenly uh, you know got introduced to a textbook, opened that reading, no it is in evolution, even the history is in discovery. The way you are discovering your future, we discovered our history through very n number of books, through many writers, through many biases. It is always important to perceive history without bias. Perceive with bias, perceive with prejudice, then it is going to be dangerous for the future of the state also further, right. So lack of biasness, that is the reason why I spoke about Muslim writers, I spoke about foreign writers, I spoke about imperial writers, I spoke about Indian writers, Indian historians, apart from Mazumda, apart from Nilkanta Sastri, we spoke about Marxist school of thought also, Marxist Hegelian thought, which considered that India had a dark cage, which considered that India has nothing to give to the world, India got everything from the world, but not India. Whereas if you see the other people like uh, Immanuel Kant, they believed that India is cradle of civilizations, right. Voltaire or you can talk about, Voltaire you can talk about, Immanuel Kant they are talking about civilizations. The birth of the civilizations in the, in the world, they consider that all the waters to the world flew from the Ganges, all the philosophical waters. So what are the sources of history then? What are the ways I should reconstruct the history? Literary and archaeological records are the two main categories that gives evidence about history. Literary source include literature of Vedic, Sanskrit, Pali, Prakrit and other literature along with other foreign accounts. Archaeological sources include epigraphic, numismatic and other architectural remains. The archaeological exploration and excavations have opened the gate of landscapes about new information. Finding new information. Every single day when you excavate you see information. information. Through information we reconstruct our history. We reconstruct our history with our information. Ancient Indian history literature is almost religious in nature. As I said religion used to be dominant before. The Puranic and epic literatures are considered as a history by Indians but it contains no definite dates or events in the kingdoms. That is a, there is one problem that the modern method of which was introduced by British the date system is not available in those. Normally if you try to understand, as I said, uh, if you try to measure the land then with the scale now, it is very difficult. So then we used to have Indian calendar. Now we are following a Gregorian calendar, a different calendar because of which in most of the texts uh, there will be uh, as Tidhi, if you understand Tidhi, Indian month, Indian week, Indian date based on stars used to be there, but not the date system which was, which we are using now. That is the reason why most of the historians say that Puranic and Epic literature dates are not, not available. But remember, when Rama born, when Krishna born, all this in Indian calendar it is clearly mentioned in those texts. That is the reason why we derive that. The effort of the history of writing was shown by large number of inscriptions, coins and local chronicles. As I said, in local chronicles history is embedded. The history is embedded in the local chronicles. The principles of history are preserved in Puranas and epics. Puranas and epics narrate the genealogies, as I said, different genealogies of different kings. I said Parikshit is the example. Their achievements, but they are not arranged in chronological order. The Vedic literature mainly consists of four Vedas, Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Sam Veda and the other one Veda. Veda, Veda means source of knowledge. So if you see Vedic literature is different from different language called Vedic language. Its vocabulary contains a wide range of meaning and different grammatical usages. It has a different mode of pronunciation in which emphasis changes the meaning entirely. So the basic example which I can say 33 grower gods. People say 33 koti gods, 33 crore gods. They always found 33 crore gods, 33 koti means different, 33 koti, koti when it is pronounced differently it is type like I said Vedic language. The Vedas give reliable information about the culture and civilization but do not reveal about political history. So but although this is very important for our exam, culture and 
civilization. Veda, Vedangas, parts of Vedangas, appendages of Vedas, six Vedangas which are six Vedangas, Siksha, Kalpa, Vyakarna, Nirukta, Chanda, Jyotisha. If you talk, if you try to understand that, phonetics is one. Rituals, grammar, etymology, metrics, astronomy. Vedanga has been written in many precepts, sutra form, formulas. This is very precise and exact form of expression in prose, which is developed by scholars of ancient India. So Vedas and Vedangas are the source of history. We talk about ancient history. Astadhyayi. Next one. Astadhyayi, eight chapters written by Panini, is a book on grammar which gives excellent information and the art of writing in sutra. Precept, sutra, formula, right? Grammatical formulas, grammar, right? English grammar, you must have understood. Panini wrote the book Astadhyay, which is a grammatical book, which is talking about grammar, right? Eight chapters. The later Vedic literature includes Brahmanas, Aranyakas and Upanishads. So Vedas, Vedangas, Brahmanas, Upanishads, Vedangas, Brahmanas, Aranyakas and Upanishads. These are the different... Uh, texts which were available, Ashtadhyayi by Panini. Brahmanas give description about Vedic rituals, Aranyakas and Upanishads give speeches on different spiritual and philosophical problems. If you have a question, ask the Guru, he will answer. It is a question and answer mode normally in Upanishad. Puranas which are of 18 numbers mainly give historical accounts. The Ramayana, Mahabharata are epics of great, greatest historical importance. The Jain and Buddhist literature had been written in Prakrit and Pali language. If you can see Jain literature in Prakrit and Buddhist literature in Pali language is very important. You see Sanskrit in Vedas, Prakrit, Jina and similarly Buddhist literature in Pali. Early Jain literature mostly written in Prakrit language. As I said, Prakrit language is the form of Sanskrit language. You can say Prakrit from Vedic language came Prakrit language. From Prakrit language it came Sanskrit. Prakriti, Sanskriti. Right? Pali language was form of Prakrit language which was used in Magadha. Again, you can see the evolution. Pali is a form of Prakrit. So, Vedic language, Prakrit language, Pali language, Sanskrit language. Most of the early Buddhist literature is written in Pali language. Pali language reached Sri Lanka through some of the Buddhist monks who are living with that language, where it is a living language even now. Ashokan edicts had been written in Pali language most of the time, except those, those which are in... Uh, uh, Gandhara region which were written in Aramic and uh, different foreign languages. Greek and Aramic. Mahavira and Buddha, these are the two important people who brought religious revolution in 6th century BC. These are considered as historical personalities equivalent to the God. They have created Jain and Buddhist religions of ideology respectively. So why not? Why not accept what Mr. Voltaire said? Why not accept what Mr. Categorical Imperative Immanuel Kant said? India is cradle of civilizations. So come back to the text. Already I spoke about literal and archaeological sources, numismatic, epigraphical, or inscriptions, right? So these are the different sources we read. We spoke about Vedas, Vedangas, Puranas, Aranyakas, Upanishads. We spoke about uh, Paninis. Ashtadhyayi, right? So these are the basic texts apart from that Ramayana, Mahabharata, 18 Puranas and Vedanga, 6 Vedangas we read. So this is the Vedic literature which are available and language is also Vedic language, Prakrit language, Pali language, Sanskrit language. So this is the evolution which we can see based on the chronological timeline. And as I said, uh, most of the inscriptions of Ashoka is also in Pali as you know that Ashoka is a Buddhist. Ancient books, the Buddhist books are called Jataka stories, right? The books of Buddhists are called Jataka stories. They have been some of historical importance because they are related to the previous birth of the Buddha. They are more than 550 such stories, Jataka tales. Whenever you go to any particular Amravati or Sanchi, any stupas, you can see all these tales which are being mentioned in those pillars are around, right? The historic information mentioned in general literature also help about reconstructing the history of different regions in India. Normally we call them as Agamas. The Dharma Sustras and Smritis 
Smritis were used rules and regulations for general public and the rulers. It can be equated with the institution of law books and the modern concept of polity and society. We can say those are Dharma Sustarata and Smritis are like rules and regulations like you can say the constitution which is a rule which should be abided by the citizens which should be the abiding factor for politicians also. So Manu Smriti is one of the important text which is ancient Manu Smriti. Normally uh, Ambedkar burns this Manu Smriti. Try to learn why. Jaina literature as I said Agamas. So where I can conclude here as of now I have completed Shruti, Smriti, Purana. These are the things which I have covered as now. Shruti when you talk about Veda, Vedic literature, Vedas, Vedangas, Aranyakas, Upanishad, all these are Shruti. Then when we talk about Puranas, Ramayana, Mahabharata, Sitihasas, Viratex, Tepics, these are Smriti. And you talk about Puranas, all those things, right? Then we talk about Puranas, Shruti, Smriti, Purana. So what you practice orally, normally Vedas will not be given directly in book form, these are to be taught by the teacher because phonetics is very important there, spell is very important. Dharma Shastra was uh, compiled, between, uh, compiled between 600 to 200 BC. Artha Shastra book written by Chanakya, so which is uh, written in Mauryan printed, which is divided into 15 parts. So mostly in prelims also a couple of questions came here about slavery, about spice, right? But most of the students have knowledge about Artha Shastra. Artha Shastra, the name says that it is talking about economy, but apart from that economy, there are many things which it talks about. The final version of Artha Shastra was written in 4th century BC. Kautilya acknowledges Jep to the Procedures predecessors in his book, which shows that there was a tradition of writing on teaching state crafts, state craft, right? State craft, polity. Mudra Rakshasha is a play written by Vishaka Datta and describes about society and culture of that particular period. Vishaka Datta wrote a particular drama, you can say a particular play that is called Mudra Rakshasha. Apart from that, the text which we are trying to read is uh, Malivikagni Mitram by Kalidasa. Kalidasa wrote Malavikagni the Mitram, right? He is in uh, Pushramita Sunga time period. When you see Chanakya, Chanakya is the courtier of Mauryan Emperor Chandragupta Maurya. When you come to Malavikagni Mitram, so we can see Kalidasa wrote this book during the uh, reign of Pushamutra Sunga, Sunga dynasty. Basha and Sudraka are other poets who are written plays based on historical events. Basha and Sudraka. Similarly, Harshachitra written by Bhanabhatta throws light on many historical facts which we could not have learned otherwise. Similarly, Vakpati wrote Gaudavaho based on exploits of Eshovarman of Kanoj, right? What this particular Eshovarman did, Vakpati wrote in Gaudavaho. Similarly, Vikramanka Deva Charitra, written by Bilhana, describes the victories of later Chalukya King Vikramaditya. The name itself is saying Vikramaditya Deva Charitra, written by Bilhana. Right? Harsha Charitra is written by Bhanavata. Right? Similarly, some of the prominent biographical works which are based on the lives of the kings are Kumarapala Charitra. So, a couple of Kumarapala Charitras are there. Kumarapala Charitra of Jayasimha. Kumarapala Charitra or Dvayashraya Mahakavya of Hemachandra. Similarly, Hamira Kavya by Nayachandra. Navasahasaka Charitra of Padmagupta. Boja Prabandha Billa, Billal. Prithvira Charitra by Chand Bhardhai. So, Rajatarangani by Kalhani. Kalhan, right? Kalhan, Bilhan. So try to remember all these names again. We'll try to come back from Kautilya's Artha Shastra, Mudra Rakshasa by Vishaka Datta, Malavika Agni Vitram. So Mudra Rakshasa by Vishaka Datta, right? Similarly, Malavika Agni Vitram by Kalidasa from Sunga dynasty, Pushamitra Sunga dynasty. Basha and Sudraka also wrote couple of stories. Harsha Charitra by Bhana, Bhana Bhatta. Vakpati wrote Gaudavaho and Vikramanga Deva Charitra written by Bilhana and uh, if you say Raj Tarangani written by Kalhana, these are the historical accounts. Apart from that, Kumarapala Charitra, Jay Simha, these are the different uh, biographical works which are mentioned, right? 
these important here boja prabandha boja is also very important of bilal prithviraj prithviraj charitra by chan bardhai and similarly if you take uh, sangam literature sangam literature is one of the short and uh, long poems consisting of 30000 lines of poetry which are arranged in two main groups one is patinen kil kanakku and the pattu pattu one is patinen kil kanakku and pattu pattu it describes many kings and dynasties of south india sangam dynasty sangam literature uh, like uh, buddhist council sangam councils also happened this literature we don't have uh, we don't have any name which we can uh, attribute this text to sangam was a poetic compilation by group of poets differently different times mainly supported by the chiefs and kings of the local time period as i said nilkanta shastri has a greater account of this sangam literature was composed by large number of poets in praise of their king some kings and events mentioned are also supported by inscriptions so the local inscriptions which are available is supporting some sangam literature sangam literature generally describes events up to 4th century ad in south india so these are the historical accounts if you try to see you are trying to learn history from these historical accounts when you try to understand history these are the historical accounts what are those historical accounts vedas vedangas upanishad aranyakas right similarly if you talk about books once again i would like to repeat all these books because this want to be mcqs in your examination arthashastra by kautilya which you clearly know and uh, mudra raksha by vishakadatta malavika agnamitram by kalidasa from pushyamitra sunga dynasty bhasha and sudraka also were the poets who wrote some plays harichatra harsha charitra written by bhanabhatta vakpati by uh, sorry godavaho by vakpati vikramanka charitra written by bilhana which is the story of chalukya king vikramaditya and different uh, biographies right biographies apart from that rajatarangini which was written by kalhana is the best form of history writing valued by modern historians this critical method of historical research and impartial treatment of the historical facts have earned him the greatest respect among historians so remember i spoke about alberuni the similarly you should remember rajatarangini alberuni rajatarangini these are all non partition text where we can We, which we can trust according to the historians sangam literature as i said uh, is divided into two and uh, sangam literature who wrote that we don't have any trace but these are the texts which are available till 4th century ad so apart from that we have foreign accounts another source is foreign accounts from foreign accounts also we can understand this particular history Herodotus was Herodotus was dependent on Persian sources for his information about India. Herodotus, in his book Histories, written many volumes, describes about Indo-Persian relations. A detailed account of invasion India by Alexander was written in Arian. So Greek kings sent ambassadors to Patliputra. One such is uh, Megasthenes, Dymachus, and Dionysius. So you can see Herodotus. Normally, when you talk about history, you talk about Herodotus. Megasthenes came to the court of Chandragupta Maurya who brought uh, this particular book uh, Indica who wrote this particular book Indica but uh, although the book is lost it is being frequently quoted by many of the historians Periplus of Erythian Sea is another book uh, which is written by someone we don't know this is in Greek unknown writer on the basis of personal voyage on Indian coast about uh, 80 AD gives also account similarly Ptolemy his ge geographical treatise Ptolemy's geographical treatise is another important historical account. Greek writing about India, however, is based on secondary sources, and uh, we can consider they have errors. Apart from that, we have Chinese travelers who are Fahian, Huansang, Itzing. Fahian visited in five, fifth century AD, so Huansang visited in seventh century AD, and Itzing also visited in seventh century AD. So these are the timelines of Chinese visitors: Fahian, Huansang, Itzing. So if you see Huansang visited. Uh, Harshavardhana dynasty H H you can remember that way Huan Sang visited Harshavardhana dynasty in 7th century AD he is one of the important personalities apart from that Fahian and Huan Sang traveled many parts of the country and given exaggerated account about buddhism because their focus is on buddhism Huan Sang mentioned about Harsha as a follower of buddhism while his epigraphic records Harsha mentions himself as a devotee of Shiva so there is a contrast which through which we can understand that Huan Sang is biased towards buddhism as i said 
Christian uh, bias was there, prejudice was there, same here. Alberini gave important information about India. He is an Arab scholar and contemporary of Mahmud Ghazni. We spoke about him clearly. So done. Those are the foreign accounts we have. Alberini, one, Piansang, Fahian, Etching, Ptolemy's geographical details, Periplus of Eritrean Sea. We don't have the writer name. Megasthenes, who wrote Indica. Apart from that, the accounts of uh, Herodotus, Meg Megasthenes, Damascus, Danius, Herodotus was dependent on Persian sources. As I said, uh, some of them believed in those texts and dependent on those texts, they gave their accounts, their accounts. So apart from that, if you see archaeological sources, these are under important. So if you go back and see literary sources, is completed. Those sources of literature we have completed. Now what we have is archaeological sources. What are those archaeological sources? These are these have played more role reconstructing the history from archaeological sources. Archaeological source of Indian history is about two centuries old, just two centuries old. Up to 1920, Indian civilization was considered has begun, begin about 6th century BC as we have Buddhism, Jainism. However, the excavations at Mohenjadaro and Kalibangan and Harappa, Harappa, Mohenjadaro, Kalibangan. See, for example, Harappa, where is Harappa? You can clearly see Harappa, H A Harappa, E is at Ravi, on the shores of Ravi, P. Punjab, PA, Pakistan. Harappa is there in Punjab, Pakistan, on the shores of Ravi River. When we excavated, we found some mounds through which we started reconstructing history and came to light Indus Valley civilization. Antiquity. As I said, 6th century BC to 5000 BC, the story of antiquity. But until 1920, we didn't know. Prehistoric artifacts found in uh, excavations, we are still doing that. Epigraphic and numismatics is another important source. Coins are an important numismatic source that tells about Indo Greek, Saka, Parthian, Kushana, Satavahana, all those history. Numismatic means study of coins, clearly. When you talk about epigraphy, study of inscriptions. So these are the coins. When you see the coins, different coins were available in archaeology also, different inscriptions, different coins came out. So even during the uh, Ashokan period, I said, uh, Pillar edicts, rock edicts were there, inscriptions were there, right? So you can see Indo Greek, Saka, Parthian, Kushana kings. So those people who conquered. Inscriptions of Ashoka, Samudra Gupta provide valuable information about social, political status of people of that particular period. The study of these inscriptions will reveal more about Ashoka views on Dhamma, the religion, and the conquest of Samudra Gupta, right? You can see, you can learn about uh, Samudra Gupta. You can learn about Ashoka just from the inscriptions. And not only this, if you go to Satavahana period, you can learn about Gautami Putra Satakarni. You can talk about uh, Gautami Balasri's inscription, Nanagat inscription. Likewise, many inscriptions are there. Whenever you go to particular history, regional history, there are n number of inscriptions, epigraphic sources, literary sources through which we reconstruct history. So apart from that, as I said, epigraphical is done, numismatics is done. One of the important histories from epigraphical is Ashokan, Samudra. Apart from that, there are many Satavanas are there, Kushanas are there, uh, Satavanas are there. Even you go back to numismatic, Kushanas are important, Indo Greeks are important, Kanvas are important. Likewise, those people who came foreigners, who, who are foreigners who brought uh, Roman coins, coinage, so numismatics, that, there it is important. Even Nilakanta Sastri found uh, in Nil, uh, Kotilingala, in Kotilingala, about uh, Satavana dynasty, we have found coins uh, which were imprinted like Simuka, who is the founder of. So likewise, it's a source, whichever history you're trying to read, now you have a clear cut uh, ladder how to do it. Archaeological sources, we know the temples, rock temples, right, cave temples to the temples. Temples and sculptures, deeply architectural, artistic history of Indians, especially from Gupta period to the recent times. During Gupta period, the large caves which are called Chaityas and Viharas, which are for Chaityas and Viharas for Buddhism were there in the western uh, uh, western India, hills of western India. The Kailasa temple of Ellora and the Rathas of Mahabalipuram are carved out of rocks from outside, right? From outside, they have carved. You can see that 
Kailasa temple in Ellora, so it is carved from outside. The excavations of the cities of Mohenjo-daro Harappa prove the antiquity of Indian culture and civilization, which are more than 2,000 years old. The historic sites like Kalibangan, Lothal, Dolavira, Raki Garhi, and contemporary to Mohenjo-daro and Harappan civilization, these are the important places where we will read in Indus Valley civilization. <coughs> there are many excavations which came here. So if you try to compare where these are in the present day timeline, these are there in Gujarat, these are in Maharashtra, these are in Haryana, Punjab, Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh in India, apart from that we have many places in Pakistan. The dark age of Indian history was the period between 1500 to 600 BC, this is known as dark age because not much is known about this particular timeline. The archaeological discoveries of black and red ware, painted grey ware, malwa, Jarve cultures have filled chronological gaps and they converted, covered the geographical context. So this is where we talk about technology from uh, Indus Valley civilization to Vedic civilization to further what is different is pottery, evolution of pottery. If you can see painted grey ware, we have painted grey ware, grey color, grey ware which is used as utensils, which is used as showcase purposes, which is used for storing grains, etc, etc. Some of the important displays are, uh, discoveries are, Indians had domesticated sheep and goat started agriculture in 8000 years ago. So Indians domesticated sheep and goat started agriculture about 8000 years ago and iron came into picture in 1600 BC. As I said, uh, that is where we start Vedic civilization. Those people who are in Indus Valley civilization, we don't have a proof that they have used iron, they used bronze. The tradition of rock paintings in India proved to be more than 12,000 years. Rock paintings, as I said, uh, Bimbetka is one of the important rock painting during Mesolithic page, Me Mesolithic period, rock paintings are also important. Tools, tools found in Kashmir like Burjaham and Narmada valleys shows that human activity started in the subcontinent two million years ago. So we have a history, we have antiquity, we have a heritage to claim upon, to dwell and learn also. Inscriptions are most important, as I said, epigraphical inscriptions are one of the important source to reconstruct history. Inscriptions are contemporary to the documents at present day. We use books, textbooks, right? We, we use pages, but uh, in the history, what we have is inscriptions. The paper is not there, pen is not there, so they carved out in stone, they carved out in wood, they carved out in metal likewise right inscriptions manuscripts were written in soft materials like birch bark palm leaf paper etc they became fragile in the course of time frequently required to be copied and reproduced for our accounts but unlike uh, inscriptions are strong with uh, withstood uh, the um, tides of chronology time right they couldn't be digested in time they stood without digestion in time the script of inscriptions also helps history in many ways if you see we, we call Harappan history, Indus Valley civilization as a proto-history because we have the script but we couldn't de 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 decrypt the script. We call it as Bostrophedon, we call it as Indus script, we call it as Har Harappan script. Ashokan inscriptions, Ashokan inscriptions, as I said Ashokan inscriptions, most of them are in Pali. Just before I said that uh, one of the inscription you can see, Ashokan inscriptions are found written in four scripts. Karosti script was used in Pakistan region which was written in right to left and evolved in Varnamala alphabet system in Indian languages. So if you take Karosti, which was written in Pakistan, it is left to right, then right to, no, left to right, left to right. If you take Indus Valley, if you take Indus script, this is like this. Snake script, we can call it as Bostrophedon, we can call it as, but if you take uh, Ashokan Karosti slip, it is like uh, Karoti script, it is like uh, right to left, like Urdu, which we do now. Apart from that, Brahmi script, especially used in Karnat, uh, Uttarakhand, Uttaranchal up to Mysore in south, Brahmi script is also used, right, from Uttaranchal to south. Paleography is the study of development of scripts. So you can see Karosti is there, Brahmi script is there, Pali is there, right. And Brahmi script was adopted by the rulers of Ashoka and continued succeeding centuries. Brahmi script kept modifying century after century which led to the development of most of the scripts in India. Now when we talk about Brahmi which is source for Tamil, Telugu, Kannada, Malayalam, South and Nagari, Gujarati, Bangla in North, right. So South languages and for North languages Brahmi script is one of the source. 
the modifications in the letters of the script have been made possible by ascertain time period inscriptions were written 1837 jain's princip completed chart of ashokan alphabets so remember this particular name james princip through his hands we are constructing the history because he understood the script of ashokan times 1837 The inscriptions of Ashoka had recorded in different years of his reign and are known as edicts because they are in the form of king's order or desire. So, edict is an order, right? Edict of Ashoka proved that Ashoka was benevolent king, concerned with the welfare of the people. So, when you talk about welfare of the subjects, uh, here we are calling subjects, although we are not calling them citizens. When we talk about welfare, we are talking about uh, Part Four of Indian Constitution, welfare. Ashoka is one of the Three days are talking about welfare of people. Apart from that, so inscriptions of Indo-Greeks, Sakak Shatrafas, and Kushanas adopt Indian names after two to three generations. These inscriptions illustrate that they were also engaged in social, religious, welfare activities like any others in India. Junagadh, Junagadh rock inscription of Rudraman was written in the mid second century AD. It was early example of inscription written in Sanskrit. However, Sanskrit became prominent since Gupta period. Junagadh inscription, apart from the rock edicts and inscription of Ashokan, Ashokan pillar inscriptions, rock edicts, right? So we have here Junagadh, right? Apart from that pillar inscription, Allahabad pillar inscription describes about Samudra Gupta. As I spoke before, epigraphical sources are important for understanding Samudra Gupta. The conquests of Samudra Gupta are available in Allahabad inscription, although. these are available in kutub uh, minar now right the epigraphs of gupta period started trends of giving genealogy of kings with account of conquests and achievements this became the trend that the subsequently dynasties to give list the predecessors mentioned the mythology of their origins right so epigraphies in gupta period also are important i hold inscription of chalukya king pulakesi 2 pulakesi 2 is very strong ruler and i hold inscription is talking about this uh, western chalukyan king of pulakesi 2 and uh, his society his polity and his conquests right the gwalior inscription of boja boja is the person bojpuri you must have heard about language so whenever you talk about madhya pradesh bhopal right uh, so he is one of the important person right especially in literature gives a full account of predecessors and their achievement so gwalior inscription is another important inscription which we talk about in ancient history these are going to be the standard sources for reconstructing the history for you so apart from that numismatics as i said numismatic coinage numismatics is considered as uh, the second most important source of reconstructing the history of inscriptions coins are mostly found in uh, hoards while digging field or constructing a building like uh, when we are constructing a road when we are constructing a house these are coming out right coins found in systematic excavations are less in number but more valuable of chronological cultural you know if you size if you try to understand the value of that particular metal it's very less but uh, if you try to calculate the value of antiquity it is more earlier uh, coins were punch marked coins they were made of either silver or copper in addition to this uh, some gold punch kind uh, coins were also available so you, most of you heard about the kushanas during those period indo greek coins were made of silver copper rarely in gold kushanas issued their coins mostly in gold and copper indo greeks kushanas these are the people who are dependent on coinage if you can see this guptas issued coinage you can see that clearly numismatics coinage guptas issued their coins mostly in gold and silver but gold coins are numerous so that is the reason why normally normally not only for numismatics for the reasons of uh, literature also it is called uh, golden age this is called golden age so if you see punch marked coins when i speak about punch marked coins that bear only symbols on them are the earliest coins in india each symbol is punched separately with sometimes overlap with each other punch marked coins have been found throughout the country starting from takshila to magadha to mysore even further in the south they don't have any inscription or legend in them right they just have the symbols indo greek coins depict beautiful artistic features of them right the portrait of the bust of the king or the observed the side appear to be real portraits and reverse some deities uh, 
depicted. So initially punch marked some symbols, then the king, backside of the king, some deities were punch marked. So if you talk about uh, not only Indo-Greeks, Sakas, Parthians, Indo-Parthians, right? These also, the, their history is also coming through, we are learning through the coinage. Kushanas issued mostly gold coins, as I said, uh, Guptas issued gold coins, Kushanas issued gold coins, and also numerous copper coins, which are found in most parts of the India and Bihar. So what are the different metals we found till now? Copper, silver, gold, these are the three different uh, metals used in coinage. The king calls himself Maheshwara, the devotee of Shiva in the depiction of the coins, Kanishka, Huishka, Vasudeva, etc. All these are the depiction in their coins, right? So Kushana coins depicted uh, many of Indian gods and goddesses along with their Persian Greek deities, contemporaries. So Guptas had succeeded Kushanas in the tradition of imprinting coins, they completely had been Indianized the coinage. So Guptas is the time period, timeline where the coinage, the numismatics is taking completely Indian version, Indianization. The kings are portrayed engaged in activities like hunting lion, rhinoceros, holding a bow, bottle axes, battle axes, playing musical instrument, Sita Arvina like that, are performing Ashwamedha Yajna. Likewise, many, many coinages were there, especially when you talk about coinage numismatics, we are talking about Indo-Greeks, Parthians, Kushanas, Guptas. The type of coins, silver, copper, gold. Kushana spoke about, Kushana printed more gold and Guptas also printed or uh, minted gold coins. Most of them are punch marked coins. Earliest coins were symbol based coins. Later they depicted the faces of the kings. Later they depicted the gods, the Greek gods and Indian gods also, especially during Kushana's period. And uh, different poses of the king, king holding the arrow, bow, king is in, uh, using the musical instrument king hunting, likewise the coins are having many depictions. Coins are available from Takshashila to Bihar to Mysore, everywhere this numismatics is available, this coinage is available, Roman, Greek, but Indianization of coinage happened in Gupta's period. So boom. We have completed 33 pages here. So we have completed the source of ancient history. Most of the students forget to do this and start trying to get into Indus Valley civilization, but uh, cannot do that, all right? We will try to continue after 10 minutes. We will take a 10 minutes break and we'll try to continue this again.
Welcome back. We will read about uh, geographical background of uh, Indian history. If you see Indian subcontinent, right now Indian subcontinent is having, uh, uh, this particular Indian subcontinent is having six countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Nepal, India, Bhutan, Bangladesh. You can see in the picture clearly, right? So you can see Sri Lanka down to the bottom, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Middle East, right? These are the countries we have in the subcontinent. This is where we are talking about Indian history. When you talk about Indian history, these are the places where our Indian history, culture, society, everything is spread to. Our political domination is also spread to. Whole continent was known as Bharatvarsh, Hindustan in the ancient time. The word Hindustan is derived from the name Sindhu, pronounced uh, by the Westerners as Hindu, Hindu. The name India is derived from that particular word. India is called Bharata, the Indian constitution. If you read the first article of the Indian constitution, in the first part, we see that uh, name of India is Bharata in the Indian constitution. If you see the geographical division in geography, one we have uh, Himalayas in the north, Pamir Plateau. So if you start in geography, you start from Pamir uh, North. From Pamir North, we have uh, like uh, Himalayas, we have Hindukus, we have Suleiman, we have uh, other Kunlun mountains. Likewise, from there, which is above the head of India. From there, we will start our geography normally. The Himalayas in the north, Pamir Plateau, Sulaiman Kirtar ranges in the west and uh, northwestern side. So if you see Pamir Plateau and Sulaiman Kirtar ranges in the western side, Pamir not as I said, Pamir ranges, Pamir Plateau, Sulaiman ranges. We talk about the boundaries in which we have this particular uh, subcontinent uh, or country. And uh, northwestern side, Bay of Bengal in the east, Arabian Sea in the west, that is clear, Indian Ocean in the south. So that is what our boundary limitations. Physiographically, sub subcontinent is divided into the Himalayas, Indo-Gangetic, Brahmaputra Plains, Indo-Gangetic and Brahmaputra Plain, the other one is Deccan Plateau. So if you talk about uh, Himalayas, what are Himalayas? So these are 2400 kilometers long from east to west, if you can see about 250 to 350 kilometers north to south, Himalayas touch Afghanistan in the west, the Myanmar in the east, right? So in the Afghanistan in the west and Myanmar in the east, we have Himalayas here, which are like, uh, we can say compound wall from the compound wall. These are like compound walls, the higher lands. There are about 114 peaks of Himalayan mountain range, which are more than 20,000 feet high. So we can say this is the third pole of the world. Some of the highest peaks here are Gauri Shankar, uh, Kanchenjunga, Dhaul, Dhaulgiri, Nanga Parvat, Nanda Devi. Himalayas are barrier against foreign invasions from the north. So from the northern region, so this is the place where it is uh, protecting us from the invasions. But northwestern regions where we have uh, Suleiman regions and Pamir Plateau, this is where people came into India. So you can talk about Greeks, Scythians, Parthians, Indo, Indo Parthians as I said, all these people came through foreign invasions to India through that particular area. So you can see the passes if you want to talk about Khyber Bolan passes were well known in the ancient time. Khyber pass was popularly known as gateway to India. Identify in the map where is Khyber pass. Khyber pass is the pass through which people came into India. It is called as gateway to India. The indo kinetic plains, the plain uh, lies in the south of the Himalayas which you clearly know that it covers 255 million hectares of fertile plain area and uh, these are like uh, bowls right uh, rice bowls the great plain is formed by the rivers alternating in himalayas you can see the different rivers which are alternating from himalayas especially ganga brahmaputra right ganga brahmaputra these are the plains which are created by the rivers which are created by the rivers which are coming from this so you can see river ganga yamuna and we don't see the sarvaswati but still it is flowing here and uh, this is the in and around area is the plains of ganga and similarly brahmaputra Indus, Indus is the another one. This is the Indus plain, Indus Valley civilization when we talk about, you can see clearly these are the different rivers, but uh, we are trying to learn them in uh, Sanskrit. In, in Sanskrit, these are called Vitastha, Ashkini, Parushini, Vipas and Sutudri. Sometimes in state services, this also come into question. So those rivers, in, at present times, we call them as 
Satlesh. Satloji is called, Satle, Satudri is called Satlesh, Bias is called Vipasa, the Ravi is called Parishni, Chinabi is called Askini, and Jilavi is Vitesta. Right? You should remember from north to south and east to west, you should be able to remember these rivers because uh, this is land, fertile land for us, and this is also the lab of Green Revolution. The ancient river Saraswati and its tributaries used to flow through northern plain. The stream of Saraswati had flown through the states of Haryana, Punjab and Rajasthan, but we can't see that right now. The river Sutlej was a tributary of last river uh, Saraswati, but changed its course. The Brahmaputra originating from eastern part of uh, Lake Manasarovar and the Kailasa range of Himalayas flows eastwards where it is being called as Zangpo before it is entered into India. Brahma Putra, can you see the name? Brahma Putra. Ganga, Kaveri, Godavari, Krishna, Brahma, Putra, all are Putrikas, this is Putra. Originating from Gangotri Glacier, River Ganges is flowing in India, it is a lifeline of India. So, Indus Valley Civilization and Ganges Civilization are though these are the places where uh, civilizations dwelled in India in ancient times, these are very important rivers. Rivers are source of civilizations, remember this word. Deccan Plateau, the surface of Deccan Plateau is located in the southern part of the subcontinent. It is tilted towards the east, it is tilted, India is tilted like towards to the east. In geography you will read about that. On the western side, a range of high cliffs located which are uh, narrow strip of mountains and hills are available in the western which are continuous, which are called western Ghats. Towards the east we have broken hills that is called eastern Ghats, where the, all the peninsula rivers uh, flow through and denude the eastern Ghats. Central Indian Plateau, Central Indian Plateau stretches from Gujarat from the west, Chotanagpur in the east from Gujarat to Chotanagpur. Thar is the greatest uh, desert which is available in India, northwest region beyond the Aravalli ranges. Central Indian Plateau consisting of Malwa Plateau, Bundelkhand, Bhagelkhand, right? Bundelkhand, Bhagelkhand, Malwa Plateau, the continuous part will be in Meghalaya. The coastal regions, the west coastal region stretches from Gulf of Cambay to north to the Kerala in the south, Gulf of Cambay to Kerala in the south. Northwestern coast is also Konkan coast and the southern coast is called Malwar coast. The first one is called Konkan coast where Goa is there, Konkani is spoken, the second one is Malbar where we are talking about Kerala coast, so Mangalore, Kerala coast. Some of the ideal harbors are located in uh, this particular region. The eastern coast has very few diesel harbors, one such is uh, Vizak, Vishakhapatnam. As I said, uh, uh, the natural harbors provide an opportunity for maritime activities and uh, during the historical period these also sources of contact with uh, foreign civilizations. The southern tip of the peninsular region is called Cape of Comorin. So normally if you have to remember from uh, south to north Cape of Comorin, Cape of Comorin to Indra Kohl is what we talk about. And uh, climate, if you talk about climate, this is mostly a tropical zone and fairly warm climate throughout the year. Indian subcontinent has three seasons, one is uh, winter, summer and rainy season which is monsoon season. March to June we call it as a hot season, the temperature goes up to 48 degrees centigrade, this is accepted now in India. It follows rainy season from July to October, mostly monsoon. Then the southwest monsoon brings rain in the country. The regions of Haryana, Rajasthan and some other parts of Sindh and Gujarat receive less rainfall because uh, these are staying in uh, northwestern part of the region where this particular dry winds will reach where there will be no rainfall but western disturbances will help them in some time during the winter. During the ancient time, it is received high rainfall and created ideal condition for the development of Harappan civilization. So, again see this particular point. During the ancient time, it received higher rainfall and created an ideal condition for the development of Harappan civilization. It received good rainfall during that particular time because of which rivers were generous enough to cultivate the crops and industry or maybe for uh, foreign travel or maybe for in exports and imports. So that's what you need to learn about the geography. In this particular background, in this particular six continents, in this particular climatic zone, this is the particular boundaries which we are talking about. The history which happened in this particular boundaries is what we are considering. Geography of the ancient literature especially. The ancient vast subcontinent India was dependent into Bharatavarsha, the land of Bharata as I said, which was the southern part of Jambu Dvipa. So if you go to any temple and if you listen to the priest what he is saying, it tells all these things, Jambu, Dvipa issue, right, Uttara issue, Paschim issue, likewise. If you can understand that, you can decode that. So, where we are exactly? Jambu, Dvipam, right, the island. 
The geography of India that played significant role in shaping ancient history has been described expressively in ancient Indian culture. The term India was first used by Archimedes Persians in the region watered by river Sindhu. So when they reached Sindhu, they believed that uh, they have arrived uh, with the uh, Sindhu civilization. They got the contact with the Hindu civilization or Indus civilization or it became India. The Sapt Sindhu, referring the region of seven rivers, right? Seven rivers of the Saraswati. Jand Avesta, Jand Avesta, one of the sacred book of Parsis, Christian, Bible, Muslims, Quran, Hindus, Bhagavad Gita or any other textbook, many books are there. Jand Avesta is for Persians, right? Uses the term Sapt Sindhu for India. The land between these rivers is considered as Sapt Sindhu. The Greeks used the word Indus. So who are the people first used this word? Archimedes, then which are Persians, then Greeks. Herodotus, the famous historian, you know Herodotus, we spoke about Herodotus before, just before. Greatest historians use the term Indus and the Shaktrapi of Persian Empire. Gradually Greek Roman writers began to use the term for the whole country. Chinese used the word Ten Chu or Chuan Tu for India during the first century AD. This is the word they have used, Chuan Tu. Hyun Sang promotes the term Ying Tu for referring, for, to, for referring India. So the following are the listed terms of Sindhu, which you can see clearly. Hindu in Persian, Indus in Greek, Hodu in Hebrew, Indus in Latin, Tanshu in Chinese. It's saying a Chinese scholar says Hindu is a name used only by northern tribes and the people of India themselves do not know it because we term it as Bhartha. So which means that our internal identity is Bharatavarsh, the external identity is India. You are Indians when you go outside, when you are here, you are Bharatians. It's saying mentioned other terms like uh, Arya Desha and uh, Brahma, Brahmarashtra for uh, India. In the 6th century BC, for the first time Panini, we spoke about uh, Panini, Ashtadhyayi, the term Bharata for a region which was one of 22 Janapadas specified from Kambos to Magad in India. Bharata, right? So Panini mentioning Bharata word. Buddhist literature speaks about seven Bharata regions, Sapta Bharatas corresponding to ancient Sapta Sindhu. Again, during 150 BC, at the time of Patanjali, Patanjali Yoga, uh, a region was named as Aharyavarta. It was the region of northwestern part of India lying between Himalayas and and Pariyartraka are western part of the Vindhyas and the west. It is bounded by Aravali and the east by Kalakavana or Rajmahal Hills. Rajmahal Hills. This is what uh, Patanjali identification about India. So if you can see the local text, Bharata word is used. If you take uh, foreign words, different words like Hindu, Sindhu, all these are being used. So as I said, influences of geography on Indian history as important. You need to read geography first and come back to history, which is a second chapter in chronology. Geographical features of region influence people's activity and interactions with the nature and other groups in different ways. The type of living habits and the mode of thinking, these national boundaries, right? In these national boundaries, people develop a particular way of thinking. Indian subcontinent is a vast geographical region and when defined natural barriers in the form of Himalayas in the north and coastal boundaries on the three remaining sides. Pilgrimage and place of worship are distributed throughout the country. A sense of unity and nationality is there in India through the cultural bond from the ancient history. There are several regions which has distinct sense of regional spirit and cultural traits. Larger kingdoms and empires rose from these units and weakened in due course giving way to another unit to come up. So the cultural bonds, the nationality, the feeling of this particular nationality right, is there because of the value system which they derived from this particular culture. The Chakravarti was a concept of conquest that aspired the kings to grow their kingdom and rule the whole country. Chakravarti is the ultimate ruler of the country, the subcontinent you can call it as. The early conquerors from the northwest such as Indo-Greeks, Sakapallavas, Kushanas etc. established the kingdoms and empires in the western part of India but never shown their eagerness to adopt Indian ideas of quality and willingness to assimilate them in the mainstream of Indian society. 
the old kingdom such as Koshala, Magadha, Gauda, Vanga, Avanti, Lath, Saurashtra in the north and Kalinga, Andhra, Maharashtra, Karnataka, Chera, Chola, Pandya in the southern part ruled a long period of human history when it seems to be eternal for these particular lives. Seem to be, seem to possess eternal lives. So the oldest kingdoms when we talk about ancient history, Koshala, Magadha, Gauda, Vanga, Avanti, Lath, Saurashtra, Kalinga, Andhra, Maharashtra, Karnataka, Chera, Chola, Pandya. So these are the regions which we are trying to depict those ancient dynasties. People who are living to uh, near coastlines because we have vast coast, right, peninsula region. Those people who are living uh, in the coastlines, they developed a trade with other countries because of which numismatics came. Different epigraphs also came into picture because of this only we have Roman accounts, we have Greek accounts, we have Persian accounts, we have Chinese accounts, all these accounts through which we can see the history of us. Chola dynasty in the south had attempted to conquer the lands uh, beyond the sea. Like they've been to Malaysia, Singapore, Cambodia, Vietnam, those regions. Cholas, great Cholas, Raja Raja Chola. Although Indians had spread in many parts of the known world, but in the Southeast Asia, they developed a lasting cultural influence on countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, Cambodia, etc. because of the individual efforts of the traders and princes of that particular time, as I said, Chola. Right? The wars between the Chala, Cholas and Pandyas also led to very big uh, exploitation towards Southeast Asia. In Indian traders not only gave their religion and philosophy to people of other countries, uh, but also assimilated themselves in the region and philosophy as well. So traders are one of the important people like uh, Marco Polo, right? So although Marco Polo is a trader, but he became a different personality altogether later after observing many dynasties. So the geographical features of India therefore not only shaped its history and culture, but also mind and thoughts of the people. You can see that the geography, the land below, the sky above, the boundaries, the waters you are drinking, the climatic regions, the weather you had, these are the reasons for the shape of human lives in this particular region. So done with the introduction of the history. So ancient history, introduction, how to read ancient history, we are done with that. So Stone Age cultures. Now we are trying to talk about Stone Age. If we divide history, into prehistory, if you divide history into proto history, if you divide history into history, <laughs> right? History where we have cultural records available, proto history where we have these cultural records, like you may talk about any, any, any epigraphical sources. Uh, we have epistemological sources, but the problem is that we can't decode it. And the prehistory where we don't have any sources, these are like stone ages. There are no written record about history. There is written record about history, but we cannot deduct it. And there is written record and we can deduct it. So stone age is part of prehistory. On the base of the scientific study, geologists fix the age of this particular uh, earth is 4,600 million years. So you can see 4,600 million years ago is the age of earth. earth, earth Prudvi, what is the age of this particular Prudvi? Prudvi is a person whose age is 4.6 billion years. 4.6 billion years is the age of Prudvi. He is the person. The fossils of the earliest humans found in Africa about 4.2 million years ago. So age of Prudvi is 4.6, but 4.2 million years ago we found our first traces about humans. So we can say Africapithecus, Australopithecus, Ramapithecus, Homo Nid, Homo Erectus, Homo Sapien. These are the evolution stages. The earliest human beings were shorter in height and had a smaller brain. So about 42 lakh years ago, as I said, 42 lakh years ago, human being evolves the present form reached about 50,000 years ago. So we can see the traces of human being in 4.2 million years ago, but that the present form where we are behaving like uh, now, uh, from 50,000 years ago, human being is same. Evolution happened here, physiological evolution done. Now we are focusing more on evolution of our mental faculties. 
The fossils found in Africa, China, Java, Sumatra and South Europe portray the various stages and periods of human development. As I said, Homo nid, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens. In India, the only Homo nid fossil found are Hathanora of Narmada Valley. Homo nid is the oldest version. As I said, when you are Homo nid, we have all the limbs placed on the earth. When you talk about Homo erectus, this is the person, there are two limbs, legs, legs are on the ground, other two limbs he have for productive use like hunting, gathering, right. The third stage is Homo sapiens where he developed sensory organs, right. So because of which the Homo need fossil available is uh, Hathanaura which is in Narmada Valley. So done. So we have fixed the urge age of earth, we have completed the age of earth. Next. Paleolithic age, earlier Paleolithic tools, the stage of human development started at the time when people began the use of tools for their aid. So we are talking about technology, when you talk about Paleolithic tools, we talk about technology. It was the time to be laid the foundation of science and uses of machines. That is the reason I am saying this is the first phase of science and technology. First evolution of science and technology, when a person took a particular piece of rock, chipped it out, made a tool out of it, this is evolution of technology. So you must have had a knowledge about science, although it is not recorded. About 2.6 million years ago, human beings started the regular use of tools in East Africa. 2.6 million years ago, but I said 4.5 million years ago, we can find the traces of this humanoid in Africa. But although 50,000 years ago is how we used to be now, we are now. The evolution completed in 50,000 years, right? So you can see, in simple I can say 4.5 million years ago, we used to have hominid, but uh, until 50,000 years we became, after, uh, before 50,000 years we became homo sapiens. Indonesia, several hominid fossils are recently dated between 1.8 to 1.6 million years ago and China also earlier stone tools associated with the human fossils dated between 1.7 to 1.9 million years ago. India, no human fossils have been found associated with the stone age tools. We have stone age tools, but no fossils. The various strata of the Shivalik hills containing the stone tools have been dated between 2 to 1.2 million years ago. The archaeological site of Bori in Pune district of Maharashtra is about 1.3 million, 38 million years ago. It gives a scientific record of scientific tools. The earliest is Bori. The early human settlement in India in the contemporary to Asian countries, but it is later period than the African region. When you compare to African region in evolution, if you can see, we have uh, lesser timeline available for uh, Stone Age tools when compared to Africa, but we are very good when compared to our other Asiatic partners. So, which means our history is deep uh, when compared to our Asiatic partners. So, Bori is one of the ancient site which is available in Pune, which is taken as a point of reference for the oldest timeline available for this particular thing. Paleolithic culture, when you come to Paleolithic, Paleolithic, Mesolithic, Neolithic are the Stone Age cultures we have. Paleolithic, it is the chronology. The chronology based on, if you remember, proto history, prehistory, history. I have divided the chronology based on the literature available. But here, when you are dividing the uh, timeline based on the technology available, then that is called Paleolithic. Lithic means stone tool, right? Lith means stone. So lower Paleolithic age, middle Paleolithic age, or upper Paleolithic age. In Paleolithic is very broad phase. In Paleolithic age, which is very broad phase, we are trying to divide the timeline, the whole timeline into three phases. One is lower, the upper and middle Paleolithic age. If you take the lower Paleolithic, handy axes, cleaver industries were there. When you try to see Paleolithic age, flakes were there. When you come to upper Paleolithic age, flakes and blades were there. So you can see Paleolithic sites in India. These are the different sites we will try to identify. Lower Paleolithic literature. The time period between Lower Paleolithic was marked between 6 lakh and 60,000 BC. 6 lakh years to 60,000 BC. As I said, 50,000 years ago, from 4.5 million years ago to this, we had a good evolution. Right now, we are comparable to a person who is from 50,000 years ago. Similarly, if you can see 6 lakh to 60,000, 6 lakh to 60k is what uh, we try to call it as lower Paleolithic age. 
the main types of tools of this particular era are hand axes and cleavers along with the chopper or chipping tools. They were made on cores as well as flicks. They were made on flicks. Somehow I don't have any tools to show you, but remember these are hand axes which are available in this particular region and uh, some are made of core, some are made of flakes, right. So one is chopping tool, one can be used as a chopper, cleaver, hand axes, you know, hand axes to cut down the trees or to kill uh, any animal. But if you try to take cleaver, cleaver is like uh, uh, something, you, if you have to skin out any particular animal then use cleavers and choppers to chop the meat let us consider or chop any wood these are made as add, made on the cores as well as flakes with the external small stones flake tools right so but uh, we can understand these are not microliths these are bigger when compared to that of later ages the raw materials used for uh, making if you remember when you spoke about numismatics i spoke about copper silver gold similarly when i speaking about this particular stone what stone what stone so the kind of stones are quartzite set these are important sometimes basalt is also there largely the stone tools are made of quartzite set and sometimes basalt quartzite quartz quartz watch chert and quartz basalt okay even cards and basalt. The following are the major types of sites of lower Paleolithic age. So if you try to understand the Paleolithic age, you have to understand habitation sites, factory sites. Factory sites are the places where uh, these tools are made. So the, the way we call it as industry now, when the tools are being made, those are called factory sites and uh, sites that combine elements of both house uh, habitation and factory open air sites. These are the different category of sites which we research in uh, stone ages normally. So if you can see the deltas, uh, not deltas, the, uh, the valleys where these particular cultures are available, lower Paleolithic age, abundantly found throughout Indian continent, except, remember, except in Indus, Saraswati, Brahmaputra, Ganga, where raw material in the form of stone is not available. These are plains. Indus, Saraswati, Brahmaputra, Ganges are plains where the stones are not available. That is the reason why following are the important sites of lower paleolithic age. So what are the different tools, what they are made of and what are the different sites, that is what we have to understand. What is the stones made of? Quartzite, chert, sometimes basalt, quartz, basalt. So these are the types of stones and the kind of tools are hand axes, chippers, cleavers, chopping tools, right. So these are not available in river valleys because the size of the stone availability requirement, okay. These are to be carved, these are to be taken out of a particular plateau or maybe a mountain or a small hill, right? Let us consider that. Pahalgam in Kashmir, Belan Valley in Allahabad district of Uttar Pradesh, Bimbedka. Bimbedka is very important. First, we will try to understand Pahalgam. Pahalgam in Kashmir. So, not mentioned, or oversight. Okay, few, few sites only mentioned here. Pahalgam, Belan Valley in Allahabad district, Belan Valley in Allahabad district of Uttar Pradesh, Bimbedka and Adamgar in Hausangabad district, Madhya Pradesh, Bimbedka cave paintings are very important, 16R and Singhi Talao in Nagao district of Rajasthan, Nevasa in Ahmadnagar of Maharashtra. If you can see the plateau, so this is where plateaus are starting, right? So the Deccan plateau, this is where we are having this. Usangi in Gulbarga district of Karnataka, Attirava Pakkam in Tamil Nadu. These are the sites which are important for uh, lower Paleolithic age. Pahalgam in Kashmir, Belan Valley in Allahabad district UP, Belan Valley exception because Allahabad is where we have uh, Ganges, Bimbedka and Adamgar in uh, Madhya Pradesh and uh, 16 R and Singhitara in Nagao district, Rajasthan very far. Nevasa and Ahmadnagar district in Maharashtra, Usangi in Gulbarga, Attiram Pakkan in Tibil Nadu are these are the Paleolithic sites 
So if you try to see the ranges in which these are there, uh, some other sites which are found, if you see Siwalik ranges in Himalaya, Siwalik ranges are the ranges where we have Kashmir, Punjab, Himachal Pradesh, these are different sites which are available. Belan Valley in Uttar Pradesh, I said Belan Valley, Belan Valley, Belan Valley, Uttar Pradesh, right? And uh, Veraj Basin and hilly areas of Rajasthan, Narvada and Son Valleys in Madhya Pradesh, as we saw Bimbedka, and uh, Malaprava and Gataprava basins of Karnataka, Gulbarga, Chota Nagpur Plateau, and several areas of Maharashtra. As I said, Maharashtra is a part of a plateau clearly, and uh, that 16 are is available in Maharashtra clearly you can see Maharashtra, Nevasa and Ahmednagar sorry 16 are in Rajasthan. So some areas near Chennai, Tamil Nadu which is Atiram Pakkam etc. Some areas in Orissa, West Bengal and Madhya Pradesh. These are the important areas of uh, Paleolithic age. So mainly remember the south one Atiram Pakkam, Husangi in uh, Karnataka, Husangi, Gulbarga or you can see Nevasa and Ahmednagar in Maharashtra or you can talk about Rajasthan or you can remember Bimbedkar, Aurangabad in Madhya Pradesh, Belan Valley and similarly Palgam in Kashmir. These are the different uh, sites which are available in Paleolithic age. What are to be remembered? Remember what is the raw material, what are the types of tools and the place, so sites. Okay, Bimbedkar is very important, Bimbedkar is very important. <coughs> so we will try to identify if there are any there. Atiram Pakkam you can see here. Again, try to identify in the map, Atirama Pakkam near Chennai, right, is one and uh, Honsgi, you can see here, which is available as lower Paleolithic site and uh, which are, which is there in Gulbarga, Karnataka, present day Karnataka, Gattaprabha, Tungabhadra Valley, right. So Krishna is in, uh, sorry, Atirama Pakkam is in the zone of Kaveri, Kaveri, not in Kaveri Valley, but uh, still in that particular basin and you can see uh, Nevasa, Nevasa we spoke about Maharashtra, Adamgar we can see, Bimbedka we can see, right, Atram Pakkam site I have shown you but somehow I do not see the sites which are in somewhere here, Ahmedabad Valley sites, and uh, if you try to see in Rajasthan, in uh, Rajasthan Jayal, all these are the sites which are available, which are available for Paleolithic age. So again, remember Pahalgam in Kashmir. Belan Valley in Ahmedabad district, Bimbedka in Madhya Pradesh, or Adamgarh in Madhya Pradesh 16 R and Singetalav in Rajasthan, Nevasa in Ahmedabad, Nagar, as Ahmedabad uh, district of Uttar Pradesh and uh, Hansgi in Gulbarga, Karnataka, Atirampakkam in Chennai, Tamil Nadu. So the ranges if you see, you can see Shivalik ranges, when you see Shivalik ranges, Himachal Pradesh is covered, Punjab is covered, Kashmir is covered, Belan Valley is covered in Uttar Pradesh and uh, Viraj Basin and the hilly regions of uh, Rajasthan, Narmada and uh, Son Valleys in Madhya Pradesh, Narmada and Son Valleys is where we spoke about Bimbedka. Remember this one clearly, Narmada and Son Valleys of Madhya Pradesh where we have Bimbedka and Aurangabad where uh, rock cave paintings are important. Malaprabha and Kataprabha for Hunsgi and Chotanagpur Plateau and several other areas of Maharashtra as I said Nevasa and summer areas near Chennai, Atiram, Pakkam. These are the different sites which are available, which are important for Paleolithic age. The kind of tools which are available, the places which are available and the stones which we used. These are important for our in-depth understanding about the same. Then come to Middle Paleolithic age. So 60 lakh to 60 K gone lower Paleolithic age. Then came 1 lakh 50 thousand BC to K to 40 K. So you can see this is the parallelly, parallelly we have this. So you need to understand this is happening, some areas this also started, some areas these are also contemporary to Paleolithic age, right. It is not like uh, one ended the next one started, it is not like that. Most of the time these are contemporaries, history normally is reading contemporaries. 
The tools in middle Paleolithic were characterized as the flake tools. Those were core tools and flake tools. Flake tools, those are made on flakes, affined by striking them out of pebbles and cobbles. Take a stone, with pebble you break the stone, you will get the flakes. Through the flakes you are making a particular technology. If you are making it with core and core, if you see the core, if you talk about hand axe, you have a core and also a flake, right? So remember, when we are using flakes, the size of these tools are going down. Remember that particular point. What are the different types of tools we call? Middle Paleolithic age we are in. Okay, it's a very big timeline. 60 lakh to 60k is Paleolithic, and when you're talking about Middle Paleolithic, these tools are medium sized. As I said, hand axes are there. Again, cleavers are there. Scrapers are there. Borers are there. Knives are there. So knives very sharp. So the middle Paleolithic tools were found in central India, Deccan, Rajasthan, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, and Orissa. You can see the Deccan part is more in uh, more having these particular sites. Again, these are middle Paleolithic sites. We can talk about Bimbetka, which is there in Madhya Pradesh. We can talk about Manevasa, which is there in Maharashtra. We can talk about Pushkar, which is in Maharashtra, Rohri Hills of Upper Sindh and Sanampur on Narmada, right? Samnapur of Narmada, which is in Again, Madhya Pradesh. Apart from that, Upper Paleolithic age is the time period between 9000 to 8000 BC, which is marked as Upper Paleolithic age. So, which means we are trying to cover from 6 lakh to 8k. This time period completely is of Stone Age. 6 lakhs to 60k, we spoke the first one which is lower Paleolithic age. You can see that <coughs> middle Paleolithic age, you have from 1 lakh 50,000, 1.5 lakh to 40,000 BC is what we talk about uh, middle Paleolithic age. And when you're talking about uh, upper Paleolithic age, the time period is very less, 9,000 years, 9K to 8K. So the total Paleolithic extinction is from 6 lakhs to 80k. That is what we need to remember, right? And you also see these of just a thousand years, these 90,000 years. And similarly, if you see this, almost 5.4 lakh years. Likewise. So this is very big one. This is little small. When compared to that, this is very small. So upper Paleolithic age, the period between this is upper Paleolithic age, where it is characterized by basic technological innovation in method of producing parallel sided blades parallel sided blades, both sides, right, sword with both edges, right, normally, carefully prepared, core and in the development of composite tools. You can see we have scrapers, pointers, awls, burins, borers, knives. These are the different uh, types of tools which we have, but we can see that these tools are in evolution. During the upper Paleolithic age, the concept of composite tools were developed. The most noteworthy discovered, composite tools means one core, composite tools means take uh, one wood and then stone, right? Hand axe is wood, made of wood, axe, uh, hand is made of wood and axe is made of stone. Bone tools, some bone tools made of animals, right? Bones made of animals. So this is called composite tools. The most noteworthy discovery of the upper Paleolithic age was rubble made of platforms and mother goddess who was worshipped as a female principle of Shakti in the countryside although most of the questions are there in that particular area. Rubble platform with its unique stone was made by a group of final upper Paleolithic hunter-gatherers. A piece of natural stone in the center of the platform is found on the top of Kaimur escarpment. So you need to understand rubble platforms are found. The upper Paleolithic tools were found in Rajasthan, central and western India, parts of Ganga and Belan valleys, Gujarat, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka. Various sites in Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Andhra Pradesh and Maharashtra were upper Paleolithic period lasted for about 10,000 years, up to 10,000 years. So if you try to identify the sites clearly, from the bottom I would like to see, I, I would like you to see from the bottom. So here Atiram Pakam is there, you can see Upper Pakam from lower Paleolithic age clearly, right? So. This is composite one, all, all periods were there. For example, if you take Bimbedka, Bimbedka is there in both lower Paleolithic and middle Paleolithic, likewise. 
So apart from that, we have here Renigunta, Gudiyam, Nandipalli. These are all of uh, Upper Paleolithic age. Upper Paleolithic age and Betam Charla, Yerra Gondapalam, Vodikalu of Andhra Pradesh. So these are in the Krishna, Penna, Tungabhadra region. Atirampakam, which we spoke about, right? Nagarjuna Konda is another important one, which is part of Andhra Pradesh, right? Halsugi, which we spoke about in Karnataka, Gulbarga, and Anagwadi, Kowali, Karnataka, Edurwadi, right? Bori, we spoke about Bori, Maharashtra, Pune. Bori is the oldest site we spoke about. Apart from Bori, Nevasa, we spoke about, Badne, Patne, Durgodi, Visadi, Bimbetka. Can you see Bimbetka site in Madhya Pradesh? He is belonging to Lower Paleolithic and Miso, uh, Middle Paleolithic age also because of which it is famous. Samnapur, Lalitpur. So if you can see uh, the Ganga belt also, uh, Patpara, Bhagor, Shivhal, Paisra, right? So if you talk about uh, uh, Madhya Pradesh, Mahadiyo, Pipiriya, Devakachar, Adamgar, Bimbetka, Adamgar. These are the regions where we spoke about this particular Paleolithic age completely. So we have here Michimgari, right? You can see this is Mich, Michimgiri. So these are the different Paleolithic sites which are important for your understanding. What is important is technology how far they have evolved in technology. The next one is Mesolithic age. The next important one is Mesolithic age. So at 8000, Paleolithic ended, Upper Paleolithic, but 12,000 to 2000 BC is where we are talking about this particular India marked as Late Stone Age, Mesolithic or Microlithic Age. So this is what we are talking about, Microliths, the name itself is saying Microliths, small tools. So many tools will come into picture, small tools. Parallel sided blades taken from prepared cores, such fine material as uh, Chert, you can see Chalcedony is coming into picture, Crystal, Jasper and Carnelian Agate are coming into picture. If you remember the, the previous ones, Quartz, Quartzite, Chert are the basic tools which are basic materials which were used in uh, uh, Paleolithic age. But when you come to Mesolithic age, we have Chert also is continued, Chalcedony, Crystal, Jasper, Carnelian and agate is also there. So these are the different uh, materials which are used in making these particular tools. The size of the tool is decreased. Tools were hafted in wood and bones. Composite tools started in uh, middle Paleolithic age only, but uh, it evolved more in this particular time. The size and shape of the tools are of composite tools, as I said. Some of the new tools, namely lunates, trapezes, triangles, arrowheads, were came into picture. So most of the tools, arrows, arrowheads came into picture. So these are the different types of tools you can see clearly, which are used by this particular Mesolithic age people. So some tools are used for hunting, cutting meat, you know, removing the skin, removing the uh, teeth, removing the bones, likewise cutting any particular vegetable, likewise many, for many purposes these tools were used. Archaeological uh, stratigraphy reflects archaeological stratigraphy reflects that the continuity from upper paleolithic age to microlithic age and it proved that microlithic industry rooted in the preceding phase of upper paleolithic industry. So carbon 14 dating available of Mesolithic culture illustrated that the industry began in 12,000 BC and survived up to 2000. So what we use stone tool technology then in Indus Valley bronze comes then comes iron right 12,000 to 12k to 2k is the timeline which we are talking about this particular Right. Then we come to sites. You should be able to differentiate between Paleolithic and this particular sites. 
So, Langanj in Gujarat, Bhagor in Rajasthan, Sarai Nahar Rai, Chopamani Mando, Art Mahadaha, Art Damdama of Uttar Pradesh, Bimbedka and other uh, Madhya Pradesh. Can you see this is also continuing in Mesolithic ages, right? Orissa, Kerala and Andhra Pradesh. The inhabitant community of the sites of Rajasthan, Gujarat and Uttar Pradesh were essentially hunters, food gatherers and fishermen. As of now, even now, hunters, food gatherers and fishermen. When the scope for agriculture comes, metals will come. When they come back from caves to the valleys, river valleys, then they walk down from the hills to river valleys, the story changes. It is a different civilization. The sites of Bhagar in Rajasthan or Langanaj in Gujarat illustrate that these Mesolithic communities were in touch with these people of Harappan and other Chalcolithic cultures uh, which traded various items with each other. So, you can see that after this, it is not that particular Indus Valley civilization. Those are parallel civilizations we can consider, parallel contemporaries we can consider of Mesolithic age. They have traded with uh, Harappan, culture is there because of they have used bronze maybe. About 6000 BC, the Mesolithic people may have partly adopted and settled way of life and domestication of animals included sheep and goat started. So beyond Mesolithic, as I said from 12,000 to 2000 is this particular timeline. In around 6K, they have started settled form of life where they constructed a house where the rituals come into picture, religion will come into picture, the predictions will come into picture hunting, gathering to domestication of animals, then agriculture, then granaries, then pottery, all this will evolve in technology. Boom, boom. Prehistoric rock art. As I said, rock shelters, when, they have, when we have rock shelters, rock art is very important. Rock shelters in India were mainly occupied by Upper Paleolithic and Mesolithic people. As I said, the end Upper Paleolithic and Mesolithic time period is where this prehistoric rock art survived. Bim Bedka is one such unitary member. These rock paintings depict a variety of subjects related to animals and scenes indicate both people and animals. Besides animals, birds, fishes and other biodiversity is also reflected in this particular rock paintings. The rock painting sites were uh, Murhana Pahar in Uttar Pradesh, Bim Bedka and Adamgar and Lakhajwar in Madhya Pradesh and Kopugallo in Karnataka. So these are the major sites. So you should be able to quote at least Bimbedka. So if I see Bimbedka painting, most of the times the questions come from Bimbedka painting. You can see this like uh, some animal, maybe a horse, I don't know, we don't know, but it looks very small. It may be a goat, it might be buffalo, maybe, we don't know. And there is a person who is sitting on it and having a arrow in his particular hand. So there are many people who are trying to hunt. So somewhere you can find boar also but I can't clearly see this picture somewhere. They are trying to hunt, that we can see. So, Akre, the color of the paint, you can see red color is the paint one. Bimbedka paints, the rock paintings portrayed human beings involved in various activities such as dancing, running, hunting, playing games, engaged battle. Those colors used in these rock paintings are deep red, green, white and yellow. Deep red, white and yellow. You can see deep red. So, brick red, deep red, white and yellow. Yellow, yellow is the background they have taken. Don't consider that as a stone color. Yellow is the background they have taken. White are some, some places they have used white. So, this yellow and these colors may be from, uh, uh, may be from vegetables, may be from the items which were available then, right. That is also explained little later. The rhinoceros, as I said, it is not a boar. Rhinoceros hunting seen from Adamgar rock shelters reveal that large number of people joined together for hunt bigger animals. So when they have to hunt bigger animals, when they have to deal the wildlife, so people go in group. Adamgar. So little more about rock painting is required for mains examination, but for prelims examinations, that's it. The Neolithic age, the name itself is saying Neo new. The Pleistocene age came ended in 10,000 years ago. So Pleistocene ended, we entered into Holocene, the other one, right? Pleistocene and Holocene. When we enter into Holocene, uh, it's a completely different world, different climatic conditions. By the time the climatic conditions in the western southern Asia were settled, more or less similar to today. 
So when we see our human beings are similar, 50,000 years ago the same human being is there, 10,000 years ago the same climate is there. So it is relevant, what they have done, what we are doing, it is relevant. Climate change is not new. Neolithic, the name itself is saying new, began settled form of life. About 6,000 years ago, first urban societies came into being, both western and southeastern regions. The peculiar advancement in human life was the domestication of large number of animals and plants. Let it be goats, let it be dogs, let it be any other animals which are being domesticated and plants also from wild varieties too, they started cultivating agriculture, desi varieties, domestic varieties. Around 7000 BC, humans in West Asia domesticated crops like wheat and barley, not rice. 7000 years ago, they have domesticated wheat and barley. Rice might have been uh, domesticated at the same time in India as shown by the evidence in Koldivaha in Belan Valley, which we spoke about in Allahabad district. Uttar Pradesh. Koldivaha. Remember, Koldivaha came into exam. So, Koldivaha is presenting the uh, earliest domestication of rice, wheat, barley, likewise. The domestication of various animals and successful exploitation of various species of plants ushered a shift towards permanent settlements which gradually led to economic and cultural development. So, from here the story of culture, the story of economy comes into picture. When human being is settled, he is starting thinking about buffers, let it be any resource. So, when we talk about buffers, there is a culture which is coming around. Neolithic agricultural regions, normally Indus, as I said the Holocene ended, Holocene started, Pleistocene ended, Indus system is there, Ganga system is there, so we have Western Indian, North Deccan, Southern Deccan, so Deccan, Ganga Valley, Indus system, these are the places where agriculture thrived, agriculture and animal domestication were the main economic activity of Neolithic cultures, unlike uh, Mesolithic and Upper Paleolithic, those people hunters gatherers. So, you can see that earliest evidences of agriculture based economy of Neolithical com comes from Quetta Valley, Quetta is in uh, Pakistan, Lorai and Job rivers of northwest part of Indo-Pakistan region. So, the POK and Pakistan regions, the site of Mehargar has been extensively examined, the result shows that habitation here began around 7000 BC. There is also evidence to use of ceramic during this period, ceramic, ceramic normally when people uh, let us consider they have started agriculture, they have domesticated these particular crops, they might have used it for preservation of these particular grains, right? Filling those grains, ceramic parts. So you can see Neolithic, uh, Neolithic cultures, Neolithic sites, we can see here. So Payampalli, Amige, Narshipur, Brahmagiri, Palwai, Kallu, Sangana, right, Terdal, Tekal Koda, Kodikal, Maski, Utnur, Nagarjan Konda, Maski, Maski inscription also famous. So likewise many Neolithic sites were there, but uh, remember these are mostly sites in valleys, river valleys, why? Domestication of animals and agriculture. Around 6000 BC, 7000 BC, we are considering that they have domesticated crops. Around 6000 BC, earthen parts and pans were used initially handmade and later wheel made. Wheel changed the dimension or course of humankind. Like initially pre-ceramic period where ceramic is not there, the houses were irregular, scatter square, rectangular shape and were made of mud bricks before pre-ceramic. The first village was formed by separating the house by waste dumps and passages waste between them. The houses were generally divided into four or more internal compartments to be used for some as storage, as I said, agriculture. Subsistence of early inhabitants are primarily dependent on hunting and food gathering and additionally supplemented by agriculture. And so when you start the Neolithic age initially, they have hunted, gathered, but they didn't give up that they also practice this particular. The domestication of uh, this particular cereals included wheat, barley and koldiwaha if you talk about in Belan Valley is also talking about rice and animals were sheep, goat, pig, cattle. So sheep, goat, pig, cattle were domesticated. Beginning in the 6th millennium BC marked the use of pottery by the human beings first handmade and wheel made. As I said, so 6k, 
we can clearly see that that particular people started using this particular technology pottery from here pottery is also important evolution of pottery is also important the moment people leave hunting and gathering and get into agriculture what is important is storage of grains so because of which every other technology will come in for the the people of this period used to wear uh, beads made of lapis lazuli lapis lazuli is a stone beads like uh, we say uh, bracelets we use or to the upper arm we use these beads right or in the uh, neck also we wear these beads in for, for women they use it over the hair also hair bands also and carnelian banded agate white marine shells shells were also used shells normally you use hanging around your windows your doors these shells are also started being used so we can consider that shells are there which means that they are from some valleys beads were found with a burial remains also so there is a kind of emotion which is attached to the technology technology emotion lapis lazuli normally this stone is available from afghanistan the people were largely engaged in long distance trade suggested that occurrence of uh, shell bangles and pendants made up of mother pearl so pearls and uh, access to oceans clearly say that that they have traded in these particular items during 7000 neolithic settlement in mehargar bimedka gan mehargar neolithic settlement marked by early food producing subsistence economy beginning and trade of crafts in indus valley mehargar is one of the important uh, site communities in indus valley during the next 2500 years developed new technologies to produce pottery figurines of terracotta elaborate ornaments stone metal tools utensils architectural style all this is in evolution the technology started triggered large numbers of neolithic sites have been found in ganga valley assam and the northeastern region as i said we are talking about agriculture we are talking about domestication what is important is valley you have to walk down from the mountains where you lived those rock shelters were given away mud shelters that took shape right so initially the shelters were square shape rectangular shape irregular shape made of this mud bricks but later ceramic came into picture these regions where they started using ceramic terracotta different stone tools right so different beads they understood that technology that is where the industry is coming from apart from indus valley some of the important neolithical sites are gufrakal and burjaham in kashmir so remember this very important burjaham gufrakal and gufkral and burjaham in kashmir are very important sites so magara chaponi mando or koldivaha which i spoke about koldivaha belan valley in uttar pradesh where i spoke about rice right first time uh, the trace of rice was found there so chiran in bihar these are the sites where we try to see that neolithic sites are there <coughs> Koldivaha, as I said, 6000 BC provided the earliest evidence for the domestication of rice, the oldest evidences for cult cultivation of any part of the world that was available. Agriculture in Bilan Valley began around 6500 BC. Rice cultivation of barley was also attested to Magara, right? The radiocarbon dating C14. Bone remains from Koldivaha and Magara show that cattle, sheep, and goat were domesticated. These are the evidences which we are talking from Koldivaha, Bilan Valley. the early neolithic sites like burjaham which is in jammu kashmir lived in pit dwellings so they dug and lived in there unlike uh, erecting a structure over and above the land they dug inside and they lived in it right pit dwellings rather than building houses on the ground the settlement of chiran in bihar the later period to indus valley civilization small polished neolithic stone axes have been found in chachar hills garo and naga hills which we are talking about meghalaya right when you talk about meghalaya small polished tools so the difference between another factor is that aesthetics of that particular stone tool when you talk about paleolithic tool that is rough in texture when you come to neolithic and uh, further you see that those are polished and uh, which are having complete grip the excavations are uh, surtaru near gohati revealed that shoulder cells and round butted axes associated with the crude cord and basket marked pottery the new patterns of subsistence found in south india that was almost contemporary to harappan culture following are the important sites in uh, 
नार्थ सौत् इंडिया कोडेकल उटनूर नागार्जुनको पालवाई इन आंध्र प्रदेश टेक्कलकोट मस्कि नरसीपूर् संकल हल्लूर अं ब्रह्मगि इन कर्नाटक पैंपल इन तमिलना दीस् आर् दिफरेंट प्लेस इन सौत् इंडिया विच वी नीट रिमेबर सो नियोलिथि एज इन सौत् इंडिया डेटेड बैक् टू टू थौज सिक्स हंड्रेड टू एट हंड्रेड बीसी वी आर टाकिंग अबउट सौत् इंडिया अबार्ट फ्रम नार्थ इंडिया सो फेज वन इफ यू सी नो मेटल टूल अट हाल फेज टू इट इस मार्क् विद टूल आफ का अंड ब्रांज ब्रांज नार्मली वी गिव इट टू इंडस् वाली सिविलेशन अंड लिमिटेड क्वांटिटी पीपल हेव डोमेस्टिकेटेड कैटल इंक्लूड कौ बुल शी गोट अंड प्राक्टिस अग्रिकलर अंड दे हेव सोन अंड टूक ग्राम मिलेट रागी सो यू कैन अंडरस्टा रागी संगटी इफ यू टाक अबउट दीज वन आफ द स्टापल डयट इन द कर्नाटक अंड आंध्र प्रदेश रीजियन पाट्री आफ बोथ हैंड मेड आज वेल आज वील मेड इज आलो अवेलेबल फेज थ्री इट इस वेर वी स्टार्ट यूजिंग ईरन सो यू कैन सी दैट फेज वन rock stage phase 2 bronze age third iron age so first one stone age second one indus valley third one vedic civilization right the evidence discussed above leads to draw a certain broad conclusion the earliest neolithic uh, neolithic settlements of indian subcontinent first developed in uh, indus river then at mehargarh neolithic culture began about 8000 and soon it came to widespread phenomenon we don't have to remember all those things people lived in mud houses wheat and barley were cultivated sheep and goat were domesticated cattle all these are also domesticated long distance trade was also there because we saw lapis lazuli different beads different shells different uh, pearls 3000 bc the neolithic culture was widespread phenomenon and covered large part of indian subcontinent you can see that from 3000 to 2000 you can see that neolithic cultures are broad now more polished tools are available domestication is there right domestication is there agriculture practice is there okay So I hope you have understood what we have discussed about Stone Age. Now we have completed Stone Age. We have completed Paleolithic Age, in which we spoke about Lower Paleolithic. Then we spoke about Middle Paleolithic. Then we spoke about Neolithic. Uh, sorry, low, uh, Upper Paleolithic Age. Then we spoke about Mesolithic, which is Microlithic. Then we spoke about Neolithic Age. So stone tools, stone tools, hunting gathering, hunting gathering, agriculture settlement, rice, white, barley. trade settlements are more right the total history is packed from 6 lakh to 2k complete stone age is from the range of 6 lakh years to 2000 so that is what the history available all right so i hope you understood as of now we will take a break for 10 minutes
welcome back again. <coughs> we'll be talking about Chalcolithic period in India, the next one. So as I said, by the end of Neolithic period, full-fledged civilization was developed in Indus Valley and Saraswati Valleys in the northern part of India. So you can see that in the northern part, especially in the Sapta Sindhu region, a complete civilization, new civilization was developed intensely focused in that particular area where more research is happening even now. A completely different kind of culture known as Chalcolithic culture developed in central India and Deccan region, so to the downside also. They however never reached the level of urbanization in spite of they were using metal. They however never reached the level of urbanization in spite they are using metal. They were contemporary of Harappan culture, but other, some other were the of Harappan age, some other were of Harappan age. So contemporaries, so different cultures we have here. Important Chalcolithic cultures were Ahar culture, Kayata culture, Malwa culture, Savalda culture, Jorba culture, Pravas culture, Rangapur culture, these are the different cultures which are developed under this particular time, 2000 to 1500 BC, around in and around. What are the common features of this particular culture, Chalcolithic culture? The first one is they have used a, a kind of pottery which is unique painted earthenware, usually black on red. Usually painted black on red. They use specialized blade and flake industry of Silicious metals like uh, chalcedony and chert, which are also used in uh, Neolithic age. However, the use of copper and bronze tools also evidenced for a limited scale. So, Chalcolithic age, so they have used uh, to a limited time copper and bronze. Economically, was largely based on subsistent agriculture, stock raising, hunting, and fishing. Painted pottery is most distinguished of Chalcolithic culture. This is one of the important distinguished feature of Chalcolithic culture. <coughs> you can see Kayata culture is distinguished uh, from a sturdy red slipped ware painted designs in chocolate color, the red painted buff ware and combed ware bearing incised patterns. This is what we have in Kayata culture. The Ahar people, the other culture made of unique black and red ware decorated with uh, white designs. Prabhas and Rangapur wares both were derived from Harappan cultures and are called uh, lustrous red ware because of their glossy surface. So we are talking about pottery, evolution of pottery. The Malwa culture is slightly coarse in fabric but has a thick buff surface over which designs were made either red or black. Our Jorve ware is painted black on red again has a matte surface treated with wash. So I say Many cultures we can see here, these cultures are where uh, we can see Chalcolithic evolution. Right. Majorly we call this Chalcolithic age because we are using copper. So we can see that stone age is gone then we are seeing a age where copper is being used. Then comes bronze age which is Indus Valley civilization later, but we can see as contemporaries. So major cultures in this particular are Ahar culture, Kayata culture, Malwa, Savalda, Jorve, Prabhas, Rangapur. These are the major uh, cultures which we spoke about. Apart from that even stone tools were also being used contemporarily. Well known pottery forms of this particular culture are dishes on stand spouted vases, stemmed cups, pedal stud balls, big storage jars, spouted basins and bowls. Mostly for uh, accompanying this uh, domesticated uh, agriculture, rice, wheat, barley especially. The centers of these cultures were flourished around Rajasthan, which are semi-arid regions, Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat, Maharashtra, where this pottery also evolved. The settlements of Kayata culture were mostly located in Chambal river 
in uh, Madhya Pradesh and triple trees, they were only a few number and relatively small in size and biggest not over 2 hectares. Kayata culture mainly in Madhya Pradesh. Ahar culture were larger, Kayata culture the settlements are less, the settlements of Ahar culture are little broader. Excavation revealed that they used stone, mud bricks, mud for construction of houses and structures and uh, different fortified settlements. The settlements of Malwa culture mostly located in uh, Narvada, you can see all those are all basins we can see, Narvada and tributaries. The three best known settlements of Malwa culture are Navthadoli, Erana and Nagada. So Navthadoli was one of the largest Chalcolithic settlements in the country, remember this. Now the Toli is one of the largest Chalcolithic settlements in the country, it was spread among 10 hectares. Some of these sites were fortified, Iran also fortification wall with moat. Nagada was the bastion of mud bricks, so mostly mud, mostly the material which is used for pottery. Very few, not more than half dozen settlements of Prabhas culture were known, Prabhas, Rangapur cultures. Prabhas and Ranga, Rangapur, if you can see Gelo, Kolubar, which are in the Gujarat, these are the, uh, from the river sites. And if you talk about Jarve culture, another copper another Chalcolithic culture, Jarve culture, more than 200 settlements were known, greater number of these settlements are found in Maharashtra. The best known settlements of Jarve culture are Prakash, Daimabad and Inamgao. Daimabad was one of the largest which is of almost 20 hectares. If you see Kayata culture is very small when compared to her culture and these cultures are very broad, Daimabad if you can see, right, Jarve culture. The, 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 uh, the houses of these Chalcolithic people are rectangular and circular, one is rectangular, the other one is circular. They were made of mud wattle dock, the circular houses are mostly in clusters. If you see circular houses, they are mostly in clusters. The roofs of these houses are made of straw as a rural places will be there nowadays, which were supported by bamboo and wooden rafters. Floors were made of rammed clay. So the floors were made of clay and the roofs were made of a straw and the walls were made of uh, sometimes uh, mud and wooden rafters were used. They are cultivated rabi and karif crops as part of, as I, as I said, post Neolithic, uh, post Neolithic age they have cultivated, they have started domestication of agriculture and animal husbandry especially. Raised cattle with it, this is called farming where agriculture and uh, animal husbandry is there together, we call this farming. They are cultivated wheat and barley of Malwa region, rice was cultivated in Inangao and Ahar. So in Bilan Valley, Kuldiwaha, we spoke about rice in that particular time period and when you see now Malwa, the rice was cultivated in Inamgao and Ahar. They also cultivated Jowar, Bajra, Kult, Ragi, Green Peas, Lentil and Green and Black Gram. So you speak about uh, pulses when you speak about uh, coarse grain and uh, those arid crops are there like uh, Ragi, Jowar, Bajra. Largely Chalcoholithic cultures flushed, flourished around black cotton soil zone, normally uh, Junagadh, Maharashtra, Gujarat region, Maharashtra region. This reflects ecological adaptation by Chalcolithic people by developing dry, by developing dry farming dependent on moisture retentive soils based upon available technology, knowledge and means. So we can see that agriculture was that way. And if you want to see the trade and commerce of this particular time period, Chalcolithic age, these communities exchanged materials with contemporary communities, as I said, uh, Arafan communities, somewhere it is Neolithic. The large settlements house as a major centers of trade have exchanged. Most of them are Ahar, Gilan, Nagada, Navatoli, Iran, Prabhas, Rangapur, Prakash, Daimabad, Inamgao. These are the settlements which are of uh, uh, more big, bigger size, 20 hectares likewise. That is where more trade and uh, prosperity came into picture, commerce. The Har people settled close to the copper source as I said Chalcolithic means copper and were used to supply of copper tools and objects to the contemporary communities like Malwa in Gujarat. So all these are contemporary communities, all these char Chalcolithic communities are car con contemporary communities, don't get confused. So these are the contemporary communities of Chalcolithic age, Ahar, Kayata, Malwa, Savalda, Jorve, Prabhas, Rangapur. These are the different Chalcolithic cultures which we are talking about. These are the seven Chalcolithic cultures which dwelt between 2000 BC to almost 1500 BC. So you see identical marks embedded and most of the copper axes found in Malwa 
Jorve and Prabhas cultures that might indicate that they may be the trademarks of the smiths who made them. The same kind of symbols available in all these particular contemporary cultures which is mean that there is a trade and commerce which is available internally, one point. It is found that a conch shell for bangles was traded from the Saurashtra coast and various other parts of the Chalcolithic region. So, Saurashtra, Chal, uh, especially conch shell and uh, bangles, right. Gold and ivory come to Jorve people from Tekkal Kota of Karnataka. You know that uh, KGF movie you must have watched, right, Tekkal Kota. Karnataka and uh, semi-precious stones have been traded from various parts of Rajpalla in Gujarat. Inamgao pottery has been found in several sites located away. This is shows that Jarva people used to trade even pottery to the distance places. As we see Inamgao, Inamgao pottery has been found in several sites located far away. Wheeled bullock carts were used for long distance trade. As I said, the caravans, Arabi, Arabs used caravans the same way, wheeled bullock carts not only for uh, trade but also for long distance travel and tourism, right. Transport, trade, commerce. So if you see the religious beliefs during the Chalcolithic age, uh, this is important because it is interlinked with the different Chalcolithic cultures. Worshipped mother goddesses and a bull. The major uh, phenomenon of this particular Chalcolithic age is that they worshipped mother goddess and bull. Malva in Malva, the bull cult seems to have been predominant in Ahar period especially. A large number of both naturalistic as well as childish lingas has also been found in most of this particular site like Ahar, Kayasta, Kayata. The realistic or naturalistic ones have served ritual offerings. Mother goddess and bull important. The mother goddess is depicted in a huge storage jar of Malva culture and applic design. She is surrounded by a woman on the right and a crocodile on the left by the side which is represented by a shrine. So this is what we are trying to understand the religion. The painted design of a pot, a deity is shown with uh, disheveled hair recalling the Rudra of later period. So Rudra, normally when you come to Vedic times, so you speak about Rudra with uh, those loose hair. A painting jar on Daimabad found a deity surrounded by animals and birds such as tigers and peacocks. So the same evolution culture, right? And even now we have those animals which are being the vahanas of gods and goddesses. It is similar with uh, Shiva Pashupati which is found in uh, Mohanjadaro. Two figurines belong to late Jorve cultures found in Namgao have been identified as Proto Ganesh which is worshipped success for embarking on undertaking, you know Ganesh, so Adi. Headless figurines were found in Namgao, which have been uh, likened by the goddess of uh, Visira of Mahabharata, maybe. They are trying to compare. Apart from that, if you can see a large number of fire altars, they must have done uh, different uh, yajnas. Fire altars have been found Chalcolithic sites during the course of excavations shows that fire worship is widespread phenomenon. Fire worship is not, uh, uh, not only uh, domestic to Hindu religion but also important for Parsi and other religions. The people Chalcolithic had a belief that life after death is there, reincarnation is there, rebirth is there. It is indicated by existence of pots and other infantry objects found in the burials of Malva and Java people. So when you dig out those burials, we can see that those cultures which are clearly talking about rebirth, right. So these archaeological sources is talking to us. The Chalcolithic cultures grown during 3000 to 2000 BC as I said. Excavation shows that large number of settlements of Kaita, Prabhas, you can say Ahar, Baltal, Prakash, Nevasa were deserted due to decline of rainfall which made it uh, hard for the agriculture communities to sustain. They were occupied after 4 or 6 centuries later. So we may consider lack of rainfall as a reason for decline. <coughs> if you take the technology part, as I said, Chalcolithic people were farmers, not hunters and gatherers. These are clear farmers unlike Neolithic age. They made considerable progress in ceramic industry, metal industry because I am saying they have used copper, Chalcolithic is because they have used copper. They used painted pottery, red over black, black over red, different textures polished, which well made and well fired in brick kilns. 
it was fired with a temperature of 500 to 7000 degrees centigrade so they know how to use fire well right like the stone age people metal tools were mostly made of copper obtained from k3 mines it is very important even now in rajasthan some of the common tools used were axes chisels bangles beds hooks etc a gold ornament was found only in jorve culture which was extremely rare and uh, an ear ornament in prabhas culture crucibles and pairs of tongs of copper found in inamgaon illustrate that working of goldsmiths the capital good of a goldsmith the chalcedony drills chalcedony is the element drills were used for uh, perforating beds of semi precious stones perforation lime was prepared out of a kankar that was used for painting houses and lining storage bins even if you go to rural areas even now limestone is used for painting houses that is the culture which we are talking about copper hoard culture copper chalcolithic when you talk about chalcolithic you are talking about copper a copper harpoon was discovered in bitur kanpur district in 1822 since then nearly 1000 copper objects has been found in almost 19 localities in various cities of india mostly copper objects have been found in hoards like poles piles therefore these are known as copper hoards like copper industry right the place where these things happen the largest reserve found in gungeria madhya pradesh so it consisted almost 5 424 uh, uh, tools different tools harpoons antenna swords and anthropomorphs were confined to uttar pradesh various kinds of cells rings and other objects are also found in diverse geographical regions like rajasthan gujarat madhya pradesh bihar west bengal and maharashtra the scientific analysis of this particular items if you can see the scientific analysis of this particular items generally made of copper although very insignificant quantities of alloys have been noticed in some alloys alloy culture is not there k3 copper mines and in the hilly regions of almora district in uttaranchal were considered as a source of this particular metal copper hoards consisted weapons tools and other objects for regular domestic usage harpoons and antenna swords were used for weapons while various kinds of cells and axes were also used as a tools bar cells seem to have been used for mining ores bigger ones metals anthropomorphs were possibly the objects of worship normally anthropomorphs are uh, objects of worship made of metal of size 4 to 10 cm were worshiped as shani devata the god of shani all over north india even now so we can see the traces of mother goddess we can see the traces of uh, ganesh we can see the traces of shani more or less and uh, very important one is culture technology evolution of technology pottery a culture flourished before black ware red ware used to be there now ocp came into picture ochre colored pottery culture ochre color this is the color ochre colored red burnt brick color ochre colored pottery culture came into picture especially in the gangetic plains identified with the pottery with the bright red slip and painted in blank painted in black ocp in ganges is one of the important evolution of technology so even now you can identify this ocp you can identify lal killa astinapur bargao right these are the areas where we can find traces of ocp in ganga valley this ocp culture was almost contemporary to the later half of mature harappan civilization because the pottery and the culture found all over the gangetic plains it has been found during the course of excavation and the region of sites yielding the pottery has suffered some extensive floods so normally pottery when it sees flood nothing will remain people of ocp culture used copper tools and cultivated rice barley gram and kasri kesri 
OCP cultures have many shapes and identical with the Harappan ware. So we are trying to understand the involution, we are dating into the involution and trying to see how these are linked to that. OCP culture, OCP culture is pre-Harappan culture normally we are talking about, have many shapes and identical with Harappan ware. In excavations of Saipai, the district of Eta, Eta, copper hoard objects were found along with OCP deposit. So we conclude that these are belonging to Chalkolithic. In the region of Ganga, Yamuna, Dob, almost copper hoards have been found along with the deposits of OCP, which reflects copper hoards are associated with the OCP people in Dob. But their cultural association with Bihar, Bengal, Orissa is not clear. Some of the copper hoard types, mainly cells, have been found and associated with the Chalcolithic page. So Chalcolithic age is little where uh, better information is available than Stone Age, but still less information is available. In the excavations, we keep it in the chronology little earlier than Indus Valley civilization. So next comes Harappan civilization. When we talk about Harappan civilization, Harappa, as I said, H A R A P P A. H for H A for Harappa, R for Ravi River, and R A for Ravi River, P for Punjab, P A for Pakistan. So the first time in 1920, the relics of civilization were found in Indus Valley regions, and thus we call it as Indus civilization. 1920, 21. This is discovered by the excavations of D. R. Salini at Harappa and R. D. Banerjee at Mohenjadaro. Uh, that is the reason we also call it as Harappa Mohenjadaro, Salini and Banerjee. The remains of civilizations were first noticed in Harappa, therefore it is known as Harappan civilization. Normally we call it as Harappan civilization because the first evidence available there. So if you see the geographical facts of this particular region, so distribution geographically of Harappan civilization if you see, almost 1400 settlements of civilization discovered as far now, covering almost east to west 1600 kilometers and 14 kilometers, 1400 kilometers north to south Harappan civilization. <coughs> so, the civilization around these particular rivers is considered as Harappan civilization. You can see this is Gandhara grave culture, Harappan civilization Ravi and Ropar Saklesh, Bhagwan Putra, Alamgirpur, Mithathal and I said Akre colored pottery that is of copper culture, Kudwala and if you see the lower part after Indus, so Mahanjada, Harappa, Ravi, Harappa, if you see Mahanjadaro, it is in Indus, after the merge, later part, Jukar, Chanhudaro, Amri, if you come to the Indian side apart from Pakistan, because you can see both are in Pakistan only, Mahanjadaro and Harappa, both regions are in Pakistan only, but it used to be in 1920 United India. So in Rajasthan, if you can, if you, you can see in Gujarat, you can see Dholavira, right? Rangapur <coughs> is another important one. So we can see Daimabad. We spoke about uh, Chalcolithic cultures like uh, Savalda culture, Malwa culture, Ahar Banas culture. These are the cultures where we see this is Chalcolithic, this is Indus Valley civilization. Contemporarily, we see both, right? So we spoke about this and we also understood that there is a trauma and trade and commerce between these two. The shapes and sizes of the pottery used in these two are also little related because they are depicting the Harappan culture. So it starts from, if you try to see the boundaries, Suktajandar in Beluchistan to Alamgirpur in Uttar Pradesh. So S A. Sukta Jandar to Alamgirpur, we have Indus Valley Civilization. Then if you see in uh, Jammu and Kashmir, Manda to Manda in Jammu Kashmir to Daimabad in Maharashtra. So this is we understand. 
How do you remember this Indus Valley Civilization? Remember Muhammad Sayyid. Muhammad Sayyid. So Manda in Jammu Kashmir, Daimabad in Maharashtra, Sukta Jandar in Baluchistan, Alangirpur in Uttar Pradesh, Meerut. These are the boundaries which we see. We see almost uh, 1600 kilometers this way and 14 kilometers, 1400 kilometers north to south. That is what we spoke about in the first line. About Indus Valley Civilization, if you see. Sixteen hundred kilometers east to west and fourteen hundred kilometers from north to south. So those are the boundaries which I am giving you. Almost fourteen hundred settlements are there in Harappan culture in different parts of India. About nine twenty five are sites now in India and four seventy five in Pakistan. So almost fourteen hundred settlements now distributed with Pakistan also. So if you can see the civilization size normally keeping the imperial historians in mind. The total stretch of civilization is 1,25,000, sorry, 12,50,000 square kilometers, which is 20 times of Egyptian and 12 times of combined area of Egyptian and Mesopotamian. So nowhere comparable to any other civilizations. Egyptian or Mesopotamian is a bigger civilization than that because more than 1400 settlements are there. Only 40 are located in Indus and tributaries. Many, which means 80 percent of the settlements are located in plains between Ganga and Saraswati system, which are not existent now. Saraswati is not there, but remember Ganga is there, Yamuna is there, Saraswati is there. All the three are there connecting. About 250 were uh, also found beyond Saraswati. The distribution of settlements shows that focus is in Harappan civilization was not the Indus, but Saraswati river about tributaries which flowed between Indus and Ganga. So one is Indus, the other one is Ganga, the, the middle one is Saraswati, but uh, we do not see it now. So some have uh, saying that this is Saraswati civilization also, Indus Saraswati civilization also. So we have small villages, larger town, larger settlements, normally big mounds, bigger settlements are the places where trade happen, commerce will happen, urbanization can be seen, religion can be seen, all these aesthetics can be seen. So because of which we need to remember the areas Mohanjadaro which we saw in the shores of Indus, Harappa, Ravi, similarly Ganwarwala, Rakigari, Kalibangan and Dolabira. Large cities like you remember Mumbai, Delhi, nowadays Chennai right the same way these are surrounded by large cities are surrounded by agricultural lands rivers forests and uh, which are good for farming pastoral communities but urban areas are good for trade and commerce excavations and mohanjadaro harappa kalibangan lothal sarkatoda dolvira has given us a fair idea about many aspects which are planning economy, technology, religion of this particular civilization. So if you can see Harappan planning, if you can see Harappan planning, the orientation of streets and buildings according to the cardinal directions east to west. So you can see streets and buildings are in the directions of east and west, the regular phenomenon even now. And north town was distinguished factor of Indus Saraswati cities. So you can see geometrically these are at 90 degrees. So if you can see these are geometrical shapes clearly. If you can see Harappan city including Mohanjadaro, Harappa, Kalibangan were having large gateways at various entry parts of the city. Various large gateways were there for entry parts like we see in video games normally. These gateways are seen even in the inner fortification areas also. So which means that the great city, so cities were walled, fortified, inner fortification is also there. At Dolavira, a fallen signboard was found close to the main gateway. It is large inscription having 10 symbols 
each measuring approximately 20, 37 to 25 centimeters, which is saying we can say it is like a milestone or entry board normally we have for cities. So, what are the different materials they have used for buildings? What are the different materials they have used for buildings? Most of them as I said are in alluvial plains, no more uh, stone age. Mostly buildings were materials made of mud bricks, kiln fired bricks, wood, reeds. In the foot fields and islands of Kutch, Saurashtra, dressed stone replaced the bricks. So, abundance of that particular stone normally. Sizes of bricks have been found identical in proportions, 1, 2, 4, geometrical in size. Completely we can say that technology is available. Doors and windows are made of woods and mats. Floors are made of hard packed earth, plastering, hard plaster. Drains and bathing areas made of baked bricks or stone. Roofs are made of wooden beams with the reeds and packed in clay. So, cementing we can consider that. We can consider that roofing is there, whereas grass used before. This is building construction. What is used? Stones were used, bricks were used, wood is used, plaster is used. Types of buildings, if you can see, there are many types of buildings, both public and private buildings. Architecture can be grouped into three, private houses, large houses surrounded by small units and large public structures. So, private houses, large houses might be king, might be priest, likewise, we do not know, right, influential people. <coughs> Doorways and windows rarely opened out to main street, but faced sidelines to protect from dust and other pollution, maybe because urbanization. Unlike previous civilizations, now we are seeing urban civilization. The view into the house is blocked by a wall or a room around the front door. This was done to protect activities in the central courtyard from the viewers of passerby. So, there is clearly privacy. As I said, the doors were made of wooden frames and a brick socket set in the threshold served as a door pivot, right. A brick socket set and a wooden together brought this particular door system. Some of the doors seem to be painted and carved also, carving is also there. The windows were small in the first and second stories. Adjacent houses were separated by narrow space, no man's land. So, boundaries are there. When a house is there, houses are not attached. There are narrow spaces. And uh, some large buildings are also found without any of these privacy parameters, we may consider them as public buildings. Great Bath of Mahanjadaro. The Great Bath of Mahanjadaro is the most remarkable feature of any Harappan site. It is a brick structure which is of 12 meters to 7 meters. It is of a brick structure surrounding a pavement. Pavement is also there. First, it is a brick structure and there is a pavement clearly. Water was evidently supplied by three large well placed in adjacent room. So, water is supplied by wells. Surrounding the bath were uh, porticos and sets of rooms, maybe for changing dresses. The bath was linked for some sort of ritual bathing, which may be common in Indian culture, like uh, any temple you go in South India, you have this particular tanks likewise. Maybe for ritual bathing. <coughs> so, immediately to the west of the great bath at Mahanjadaro was a group of 27 blocks of brickwork crisscrossed of narrow lines. The structure measures 50 meters east-west. These structures have been identified as granaries, which were used for storing grains. 
which were the similar structures were found in Harappa, Kalibangan and Lothal. These are the important regions. The dockyard found at Lothal as another important structure, it was a large structure in Lothal. So, you do not have to remember all those measurements, but see you have a bath clearly and there are rooms which are available, a pavement is there, right. To drain out water also, it is clearly plastered, right. So, you can consider there are there is a pave, there is a walkway from one side, the other side is also there, there is a pavement here and we also find some structures where they were claiming that granaries are there. The inlet channel was connected to a river by its side, wide of a wharf, a place where we keep ships. This was a dockyard where ships and boats used to come for loading and unloading of trading goods. So, we are talking about Lothal. Lothal was a trading center, Lothal was a place, it is a, it's a coastal place where a port facility is available. The inlet channel is connected by a river. So, if you see the streets and drains of this particular Harappa Mohenjo-daro, Harappa culture, Harappan civilization streets and sidelines equipped with drain system. Drainage is the feature of urbanization normally. So, you can see clearly the drains which are available, which are completely planned and very broad also. So, it can also tell the size of the population maybe. The drains were plastered. The streets cut each other at right angles and the width of the streets was in the set ratio. So, clearly geometrical shapes can be seen ratio wise. No encroachments on streets can be seen. So, maybe powerful ruler or discipline. Even smaller towns and villages have impressive drainage systems. They indicate that people had a great civil sense, sanitation and care for health and hygiene. Bond bricks were used to make drains. Small drain connected with bathing platforms and latrines of private houses were joined with medium sized drains in the side streets, then these drains into larger sewers. So, drainage completely engineered. Main streets were covered with bricks or dressed stone blocks. So, it is not open drainage again, closed drainage. So, we call this Harappan civilization a bronze civilization if you understand. Before copper civilization, this is bronze civilization. Customarily unalloyed copper was used for manufacturing active crafts and rarely tin was mixed with copper to make bronze. So, tin plus copper is becoming bronze. Harappan tools, tools and weapons were simple in form. They comprised flat axes, ax axes, chisels, arrowhead, spearheads, knives, shaws, razors and fish hooks. If you can see the Harappan tools clearly. People made copper and bronze vessels, even now in rural areas you can see bronze vessels are of more important. People also made copper and bronze vessels, they made small plates, weights, right, weights and measurement system is also there and gold of silver jewelry is considered about sophistication. So, weights of lead, gold, silver jewelry is considered as sophistication. Harappans continued to use knives, shirt blades, further a great skill of expertise has been seen in precious and semi-precious beds and weights, right, system of measurements is there clearly. You can see the engineering. Long barrel shaped carnelian beads up to 10 centimeters long are the finest examples of craftsmanship. 
steatite steatite is used for making different seals normally in trade and commerce we use seals different seals beads bracelets buttons etc steatite is used the gold objects found in the form of beads pendants amulets brooches and other ornaments in harappan civilization mature harappan pottery represents blend of a ceramic tradition and pre harappan culture which is chalcolithic culture in saraswati area it's a blend ocp asset as i said pottery is a little advanced and it is not handmade but wheel made now big storage jars were also produced pots were beautifully painted in black on the bright surface of red and geometric designs plants animals and few paintings seen depict the scenes from the stories so you can see pots were beautifully painted unlike unlike those stone age or uh, ocp where the strokes were not fine more than 2500 seals have been found as i said steatite is used these are made of steatite to depict single animal unicorn bull elephant rhinoceros etc shell working was another flourishing industry artisans settlements close to the sea manufactured shell ornaments like pendants rings bracelets inlays beads etc so these are the different uh, articrafts and the technologies which it will depict right so we will take a break we'll be winding up the session for today so we have reached till harappan culture i want you to revise till this particular harappan culture because i have used many names of textbooks many names of literary sources many tool types many uh, metals so i want you to understand the chronology also clearly and please try to revise that so that we can go ahead further and read the remaining part of this particular in the continuing session so i request you to continue reading this topic and complete as soon as possible if any particular subject is read months together you will not be digesting much all right thank you very much we'll continue in the next session